Good morning, town of Putney. Thank you very much for coming out for the 2019 school meeting and town meeting. My name is Meg Mott. Am I shouting? Is this too loud? No? Uh, my name is Meg Mott. I am your town moderator. As of that statement, I am no longer that past name. You may now refer to me as Madam Moderator. I have no opinions. My job here today is to make sure that the voters of Putney um, make the decisions they intend to make. So before we actually get started, uh, thanks to, I think, a very important mover and shaker in our community, that this town meeting will start uh, not with politicians, although those are sacred, sacred roles, but with our poet laureate. So hearing no objections, I would like to invite Char Denord to come to the podium. Is Char still with us? Oh, here he comes. All right. Our poet laureate, Char Denord. Thank you, Eva Monden, for this idea. <coughs> Thank you, Meg, and wonderful to be here. I want to thank Eva. Okay. Okay. That's it. Okay. Uh, Eva, for inviting me, for putting Megan in touch with uh, me about this. I'm just gonna I'm gonna read three poems that were inspired by Putney. I lived in lived in Putney since. 89, and um, actually lives right on the border of Putney Westminster West now. So, but I um, uh, really consider my roots to be here in Putney. Um, I'm going to start, I'm gonna have to put this in here because I can't hold both. Um, with a, a little poem called Dispatch from Putney. All morning, the air whispered things I might forget as I sat listening to the silence beyond the drone of the apple sprayer, a voice for hearing myself as someone else. Put down your pen and pick up a stick. See how clearly it writes in the dirt. What did you think? That you weren't the farthest point from yourself? That silence runs out of ink? And uh, since it's um, sugaring time, um, I thought I would read a little poem called At the Socratic Sugar House. And it's a dialogue between a younger fellow and an older fellow at a sugar house. I, what was that? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Glad it, ah, sounding a little more resonant here. At the sugar house, I said, the steam's like a ghost in the sugar house. And you said, that didn't mean anything to you since you didn't believe in ghosts. So I said, how about a cloud then? And you said, but it isn't a cloud either. It's steam. What do you want to make? Why do you want to make it something it isn't? I was only imagining, I said. Don't you ever imagine? What for? To see things. I see plenty. It's dangerous to see more than what's there. But if you don't, you don't see what's there. Like ghosts? Well, yes, ghosts and other things. Like, if I said to you that the steam is a ghost that haunts this house, what would you say? I'd say, you're crazy. What's real is here and every place else. I'm not saying it isn't. I think the same. But what about those things you can't see? You've lost me now. You'd better keep your mind on the pan too much thinking ruins the syrup. I'm looking back and ahead at the same time when I stare at the sap. 
My mind's the fire that boils the sap that turns to syrup. That sounds nice enough, but crazier still than what you said before about the ghosts and clouds. Now run that off before it burns. Do you think that someone who thought that steam was like nothing else in the world invented syrup? That's what I mean by looking back, wondering what someone saw in something that wasn't yet real, but hidden there. So when I look at the steam and see a ghost, I'm only dreaming, of course. I know it's steam, but I'm also saying there are things inside of things. The world's the way it is, always knowable in the end, always hard with evidence if you look close enough. I looked at something once and called it sugar by mistake. The little sweetness we get comes from so much work. 40 gallons of sap to one of syrup. You look at the steam and see a ghost. I look at the steam and see my grief. We're close enough in that, I guess. So let's leave it there. Either way, it comes to nothing in the air above the roof. And this last one is about our state bird, which is the hermit thrush, which we have in our woods. And I never see the little devil, but hear him singing that most beautiful bird song of all every evening. To hear and hear, the hermit thrush is set for six to sing his song as if it were the end of the world and he was stirred by dusk to sing the same sweet song again and again in the understory, as if to say, it's neither words nor meaning that matters in the end, but the quality of sound, as if we were deafened by the sun and needed his song as a key to unlock our ears, to hear and hear and understand to see and see, knowing that this one day is the end for now, which it is, it is, he claims, with a song just loud enough to pierce the woods until the night descends like a thousand veils, and then just one. Thank you, it's an honor to be here. Thank you, Chard. We will now hear, um, hearing no objections, I'm going to invite to the stage our three elected officials. Um, would you all like to come on up? Nader, Mike Merwicki, Jeanette. And um, I'm asking each person to, um, to focus their remarks on what they are doing for us up in Montpelier and to refrain from any partisan remarks at this point. Uh, sorry, it was just brought to my attention that Kim, although we all know Kim in Putney, uh, is actually not a Putney resident. So hearing no objections, I invite Kim, Kim Monroe to take our minutes. Thank you, Kim. Good morning, Putney. So one thing they don't tell you during the freshman orientation is that the state house is kind of like a petri dish where the likelihood of getting a sore throat or getting sick in some capacity is hovering at around 100%. So if I lose my voice during this, I apologize, but I will do my best to make it through this. So like any freshman legislator, I started the session with a bit of nervousness. And one of the things I was a bit nervous about was you know, potentially entering this environment where I would lose the camaraderie and the strong sense of teamwork that I experienced when I was a trooper at the Westminster Barracks. And fortunately, my fears were completely unfounded because the, the Wyndham County delegation is a very close-knit group and we work very, very well together. And, you know, what I've learned from other legislators up in Montpelier is that there aren't really any other counties that are quite as similar as Wyndham County in terms of how well we work together. So I'm just very proud and happy to be a part of this close-knit team. And I also want to say 
how thankful I am and how honored I feel to represent the Wyndham Fort District with my district mate, uh, Representative Merwicki. You know, as you can imagine, there is a constant stream of a lot of information coming at you from all different angles, and it's good to have somebody who's a veteran legislator who can show you the ropes here and there. Now, with, with that being said, I'm, I'm going to talk about a few of the things that we've taken care of so far in the session. I've been assigned to the Judiciary Committee, and one of the bills that we started working on at the very beginning that has taken up quite an amount of time was H57, and this was a bill that protects women's access to reproductive health care. Now, as you can imagine, there was a whole lot of misinformation and a lot of fear-mongering that was uh, spread about this bill, and I'm happy to clarify anything with folks if they have questions while I'm here, but what I will tell you is this. The bill that we passed in the House is one which codifies the current status quo of what has been Vermont's practice when it comes to women's reproductive health care for the last 46 years. There is a legitimate fear that Roe vs. Wade may be overturned, and in the event that that happens, it becomes the default responsibility of the state to codify how they regulate reproductive health care. So in other words, Vermont has taken the preemptive step of saying everything that we've done for the last 46 years, we're just going to keep on doing that. And in my opinion, this legislation also really shows that the state of Vermont trusts women, it trusts their health care providers, and it respects personal autonomy and privacy. Now, another issue that we've addressed is closing a loophole in domestic violence cases. Before the session started, I was asked by Representative Sibilia of Londonderry to help on H7. And this was a bill that was passed unanimously in the House just a few weeks ago. And what this bill does is it allows prior offenses from out of state to be taken into consideration by police and prosecutors during investigations of domestic violence incidents. And we already apply this practice to other different crimes such as um, driving under the influence and violating abuse prevention orders. And I believe it's very important that we hold serial domestic abusers responsible for their actions while also affording victims more protection. And just a few days ago, my committee began work on a bill that would guarantee all folks in Vermont have access to a public defender for minor misdemeanors. Some of you may not know, but public defenders are not guaranteed for all people who enter the court system. And I, I'm a strong believer in fairness and balance, and I believe that no matter who you are, or how much money you have, or, how much, or what crime you've committed, you have a right to a lawyer, and you have a right to a fair trial, as it's written in our Constitution. And another issue that is near and dear to my heart is fair and impartial policing. At the start of the session, we heard a lot of testimony from the Attorney General's office, local and state police, and multi multiple advocacy groups for civil and migrant rights. As you can imagine, there was also a lot of disagreement at the beginning. But last week, I saw something that I, I never thought I would see, which is the Attorney General's office coming in with these advocacy groups both of them had smiles on their faces, and they said, we've cooperated and we've come to a compromise. And I think the entire committee was mildly surprised, but in a good way. And this, this new policy hasn't been officially introduced onto the floor of the assembly yet, but what I can tell you is that it grants a level of independence that the police are seeking, while also affording more protection to migrant communities, and also avoiding liability for the state of Vermont itself when it comes to its relationship with the federal government. Now, on, a, on some different topics outside of the Judiciary Committee, at the start of the session, I became a member of the Climate Solutions Caucus. And I've also supported legislation that would prohibit the creation of any more large-scale fossil fuel infrastructure. And I say this regularly, but nobody needs to be a climate scientist or an expert to know that climate change is real, it's influenced by human activities, and if we don't act on it, our future generations will be negatively impacted by it. Now, I also recognize there are a number of other issues that, that folks are concerned about. I'd have to be up here for a long time if I was going to talk about all that. But, you know, I know there's other issues such as broadband, affordability, opioid addiction, and infrastructure. And these are all issues that legislators are keeping in their minds as they're going about their business in Montpelier. And one last thing I wanted to touch on is another issue that was brought to my attention was funding for the, for the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. 
And what I learned is that they are at risk of losing some of the funding that is guaranteed to them statutorily. And I'm a strong believer in affordable housing for our communities here. And so I will be doing my part to see that the board receives the funding that is due to them in the budget. And lastly, I strongly believe in open communication. And there are a number of ways you can keep in touch with us legislators. You can literally call the state house and just say to the person on the other end of the phone, I want to deliver a message to Representative Hashim or you know, Senator, whoever you want to talk to, and they will come and hand deliver us a message. So you can also email and call us whenever you want, and we do our best to get back to you in a timely fashion. And once again, thank you all very much for the opportunity to serve you. I'm almost afraid to touch this microphone right now. <laughs> My voice isn't that loud. Good morning, I'm Mike Merwicki, and boy, it's good to be back home and see some familiar faces. Um, thank you for the opportunity to serve you. Uh, it's really an honor and a pleasure, and the only downside of it is I don't get to be here with you people, with my family. So thanks for the opportunity. And I want to thank uh, Nader Hashim, too. He has uh, really jumped into this with both feet. He's doing some great work. He's doing great work in, in the Judiciary Committee and in, in our county delegation. So it's, it's really a pleasure to have him. Uh, I miss David Dean, and, and we had a, a resolution over in Westminster thanking David Dean for his 30 years. So uh, we're going to carry on that fight for clean water for David Dean as well. Um, before I forget, we have a newsletter in the back. Uh, it touches on some of the things that Nader mentioned, uh, expands on that a little bit. We also have websites where there's a more complete articulation of what we're doing, and then there's the legislative website. And on that is also our contact information. Uh, we have a great opportunity to be available and to have these correspondences with our constituents, so we want to hear from you. Um, up in Montpelier, the beehive is buzzing. Uh, there's 14 standing committees in the House, 13 in the Senate, and everything from agriculture to environmental protection, education and economic development is being worked on. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that came across as we started this, this session is that the economy is not working for everybody. And we want an economy that works for everybody, not just the select few. Uh, to that end, uh, last year we started this work, we're continuing it this year. Uh, people on the lower end of the, or actually middle and working class people have not seen the benefits. Uh, what we're not going to do this year is we're not going to tax Social Security benefits for those who, whose income is under $60,000 a year. It's a small thing, but for people who are living just on Social Security, it can be an important thing. The other thing that we're, we're going to be working hard for is last session we passed a paid family leave bill and the governor vetoed it. It was one of 11 vetoes. Uh, we, we have a sense that the governor's working better with us and uh, we're hoping we can pass this. Every other industrialized nation in the world provides for paid family leave and we should do it too. Um, parents shouldn't have to make that choice between caring for a sick child or a sick a parent who's sick, an aging parent, we should join the rest of the civilized world. Um, minimum wage increase is another thing we're working on. Uh, currently the minimum wage is about 10.20 an hour, I think. Trying to live on that's pretty tough. And what we found is when the people who, who earn a minimum wage get more money, they found this in other places that have raised it. They tend to spend the money locally. And, and why wouldn't we want to help the local economy? So that's another thing we're doing to try and, to try and uh, level the playing field. As, uh, as Nader mentioned, we have a climate caucus of legislators who are committed to making this a priority concern. Um, what we're addressing is what I call climate chaos now. It's, uh, we're seeing weather we haven't seen, we're seeing the extremes. And uh, we're trying to help people understand the difference also between weather and climate. And what happens from day to day is not necessarily the indicators for climate change,
but it's a con contributor. Uh, one of the things we're doing uh, right off the bat is uh, our attorney general won a, a class action settlement against Volkswagen. They were they got caught cheating, and states got money, and we got about eight million dollars from that settlement. And what we're going to do is we want to turn that right around and help reduce our carbon footprint. One of the biggest things that, since we have a lot of uh, older housing stock in Vermont, is we want to increase the money that we put into weatherization and start to expand so people, not just the lowest of income people, but more moderate income people can access this too. We have a lot of houses that are basically heating the out of doors. And we want to, we want to reduce that part of our carbon footprint. We have a plan in Vermont to, to get to um, a renewable energy levels and one of the things and, and clean energy levels too. By 2050 we want, we want to be 90% of uh, clean energy. We're going to need a lot more electric cars. Now Vermont's electric portfolio is pretty green. Uh, so when we have electric cars, we're, we're plugging into a green system. So to that end, we're going to put some of that Volkswagen money into subsidizing purchases of electric cars. But more importantly, I think, creating the infrastructure. Because what we're hearing is people who have electric cars don't know, always know where they can go to charge that car. And if you can't charge it, it's going to be hard for people to get around and use it. Um, and of course, there's that connection between forest and agriculture. Um, our, our forest land, our soils, can absorb carbon if we're good stewards of that. So we want to make sure that we, we protect the forest land we have here, we use it well, and also make sure its soils are regenerative enough that they can sponge carbon to the degree that it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a, a big contributor. Um, Nader mentioned the VHCB, the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, and I thank the people from Putney who and Dummerston in Westminster who came up for VHCB Day. And what he was referring to specifically is this governor wants to take some of the money from the property transfer tax that's supposed to be earmarked for housing and conservation. And he wants to put it into the Lake Champlain water cleanup. Well, of course, we all want to clean up the water, but we need to find another designated source for that. Um, so we want to make sure we continue to conserve land uh, Putney Mountain Association is doing great work. Um, we want to continue to build workforce housing like we have down here now with the, with the units on, um, on Old Depot Road. And if we're going to continue to bring younger people into Vermont, we need housing, we need broadband, and we need a social climate that accepts all people. And one, of the, one of the things that Nader and I are clear about is we want to make sure as Vermont's landscape changes that people are welcome here, no matter their race, gender orientation, economic status. We want everyone to feel welcome here. And what we're saying is it's not so much that there are individuals who are responsible for this or to blame, but all of us are responsible for creating a system that is welcoming to all. And uh, with that, uh, I guess I'm getting my, my cue here to finish up. But I hope we can move forward and know that we're working to create a system that works for all of us. So thank you very much. Thanks, I'll try to be brief. I'm Jeanette White, for those of you who don't know, and it continues to be an honor, more and more of an honor every year as I make decisions that many of you might disagree with. So in the Senate, we serve on two committees, and my morning committee is Judiciary. And just a couple things that we've been doing there. We're always looking at reforming our prison, the whole criminal justice system, system, but in particular, our corrections and our prisons. And in 2011, it was um, predicted that if we kept on our trajectory, that we would have 2,800 incarcerated people in 2018. We now have 1,700, so we have been working to reduce that population. And I'm not going to go into any more detail, but I've put together a little, just a handwritten thing on who really is in prison, 
who, what the uh, charges are, who's incarcerated. So I'll have this afterwards. I think we're going on over to Dummerston, but then we'll be back and I'll have some here. I didn't print enough to leave around. We just, in the judiciary and then out of the Senate, passed finally a, well, again for the fifth time, a tax and regulate system for cannabis. Um, and we're hoping that this year it might have a, a better path through the House. Um, we did pass something called a consumer protection bill, and I'm just going to give you one little example. There are, every time you go down to the bottom of something you buy and you say, I agree to these terms, you are agreeing to many things that you don't need, know you're agreeing to because you don't read them and you want the service anyway or the product. So here's just an example in an employment contract. You just got the dream job that, and when you signed, what you did is you signed, if you have a sexual harassment um, complaint, you have six hours to report it. You have one minute to give a deposition. You have to go to Nevada to have your complaint heard. You get to pick from a, a group of arbitrators who happen to all be VPs of the company and you've given up your right to a jury trial. Those are the kinds of things that are called unconscionable clauses in standard form contracts, and we've just made them unenforceable in Vermont. We hope. And that goes for products too, and we hope it'll pass the House and be signed by the governor. So, um, I, in the afternoon, I chair the Government Operations Committee, which I think is of as the foundation of democracy. We deal with elections, municipal issues, law enforcement, uh, the military, the structure of government, and one of the things that we're doing there right now, besides a lot of election cleanup and a lot of miscellaneous things, we've just, I've just become aware, many of you probably know, are much more informed about this than I, that um, we're now beginning to see the new Agent Orange. The, the burn pits that people have been serving near in the, their four theaters. And it's come to our attention that the VA is looking at this like they did Agent Orange. There'll be years and years and years and many, many deaths before they actually acknowledge it and do something about it. So our committee has been taking testimony from our federal delegation, the VA, the Guard, the Vermont Medical Society, the Department of Health, um, anybody we can hear from, and we're going to try and tighten that up to get. If you know anybody that's a veteran and served in those four theaters, they need to sign up for the burn pit registry. That's very, very important, and I'll talk more about it to people who are interested. So we also deal with constitutional amendments. This year we have five. And if you don't know how constitutional amendments work, it takes two bienniums for them to pass, and then it goes to the general population. So we are dealing with constitutional amendments. And as Mike said, we do have a better relationship with the governor this year, I think. He is sending his people into our committees. We're working with them. So when we get to the end of issues, we shouldn't hear, I don't agree with that. I'm, not, I'm just going to veto it. We've been working closely with the administration. And we just, one more thing, we just passed out the PFOA, I'm sure you're aware of it in the waters, um, primarily in Bennington, it's now in Halifax, um, and it's all over the state. We just, there are 5,000 classes of PFAs, they're called. Don't ask me what that means, but um, we have just passed out of the Senate Natural Resources Committee the strongest PFA legislation in the country. So hopefully we'll be able to get that passed through the Senate and the House. And, and I just want to mention one thing. This, if you haven't been up to Montpelier lately, you should, you should go. But you should also watch on um, public television, I mean not public television, the community television. They Orca filmed when they were raising, we have a new series on the top of the building, a new statue. And I didn't get to go to the um, ceremony. But I watched it, and when they were filming it, they zoomed in on her face as she was going up, and she was moving like this in the wind as she was being hoisted up, and she actually took on a personality, and she became real to me. If you have a chance to watch that do, it's just, 
it's just stunning and it just lets you know what Vermont and the State House is all about, I believe. So thank you. Thank you very much to our representatives. Um, and um, I'm, it sounds like they will be around today if you have any questions, and you can also reach them through email or through calling the State House. So um, if it's all right, I'm going to suggest that we move on to the school meeting. Um, I am requesting, if there are no objections, for Herve Pelletier, the principal, Lyle Holliday, superintendent, and Frank Rucker, the business manager, to come onto the stage. Have we figured out why it does the buzzing yet? Does it have to do with my stool? No, I'm hoping not. Okay, so some preliminary remarks. Um, first of all, um, we're going to be using microphones and in order to get people's voices. And here's a little quotation to help you when you think about the microphone. Though you may feel weak in the knees and stomach, let your heart and your stomach, wait, let your heart and your voice be strong. That's true, okay. My stomach is feeling a little off right now. I don't know what that may be about. Uh, maybe nerves. I told somebody for a town moderator on town meeting day, it's like being a bride on your wedding day. I am feeling a slight tendency in the stomach, but I'm assuming it's all going to go well. So, um, before I start reading in the articles, I just whoa. I just want to go over some of the ground rules. Uh, there are three authorities that govern a town meeting. One is Robert's Rules, the other is Vermont Statutes, and then the third is, in my family we might call it Mommy Smash. It's basically the role of the moderator to rule something out of order. Um, and the lovely thing is, is that if you don't like one of my decisions, you may appeal it. So it's Mommy Smash with a slight variation. Uh, if you do not like, for instance, if I'm saying it appears that we're ready to conclude a discussion and we will now move on to another article, um, you may say, no, I don't like that. In which case, then I'm going to pick up my Robert's Rules and I'm going to keep an eye on Tom Ehrenberg, who has uh, graciously agreed to be the parliamentarian for today, and then we will go down that road. Um, there is in your town report some information on page 92. There's a glossary for town meeting. And on page 93, there's Robert's Rules Cheat Sheet. Uh, these are provided for the town in order to help you understand some of the niceties so that you don't have to read this entire book. Guess what I've been doing all weekend? Ooh, I love this. I can tell you the difference between an incidental motion and an accidental motion. Or if I can, I'm going to look at Tom Ehrenberg. Um, even though there is this lovely information in your town report, there are a couple of um, things that need to be addressed before we get started. And that is, um, particularly because as you may have noticed, we have a couple of articles that are going to be voted by Australian ballot. So if you look at page 92, there is some information here about Australian ballot. Um, however, what's in your town report is somewhat misleading because there is state statute uh, which say that we may not have, while we may not have any public discussions about election, so article one is, is about an election, that doesn't mean we cannot have discussion about non-elected what do I want to call them? Non-election ballots. So we will be, when we move to the other part of the meeting on Article 8, we are going to be uh, talking about a, uh, Article 8 is by Australian ballot, but it's not an election. So just to clarify this, now I find this totally fascinating, I don't know if the rest of you do, uh, but we may not discuss anything having to do with school board elections. 
So when we move to school board articles, yes, please ask lots of questions about any of the articles having to do with the school board. With the exception of Article 1, we do not engage in any politicking while uh, a vote is happening. However, when we get to another article, uh, and this is where I'll read this again after lunch, but I wanted everyone to know that the town report should have said when it came to Australian ballot that public discussion of ballot issues and all other issues appearing in the warning other than election of candidates shall be permitted at the annual meeting regardless of the location of the polling place. So uh, there is nothing to dis there's nothing to stop us from having a discussion with regard to Article 8 when we get to that point. Um, I believe those are the oh only corrections. Um, well, when we move, if you look on 92 on Passover, um, it says at the end of Passover, in parentheses, an article may also be passed over because it will be handled by Australian ballot. That is, again, somewhat misleading. That is true for any um, article that has to do with elections. It is not true of any article that does not have to do with elections. Last little point of order, uh, oh, sorry, uh, point of clarification is on page 93 at the very bottom, the town meeting cheat sheet. It says when we do votes, uh, at the very bottom of the page, it says if it is not obvious which side won, the moderator will call for a hand vote. In fact, anyone can call for a hand vote. So that um, does not need to be the moderator who, when we're getting a voice vote, determines whether the ayes or the nays have it. Um, so, I'm just going to go over a few other things. Um, are we okay, Steve? Yes, I'm just going to suggest that you use the two Oh, yeah. Just to speak to Close the mic. Okay. Um, Steve Orheis is the one who um, does this every single year, helps us with the sound. And I really want to give a shout out to Steve for taking care of all these issues that we have. Uh, may we find out who our runners are today? <laughs> would, the, would the runners be willing to introduce themselves? <laughs> yeah? Do you want to tell us your names? C could somebody repeat Mary. that? Mary. 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 Mary, yes. And who else do we have? And we also have Maddie. Thank you so much, Mary and Maddie, our runners for today. Uh, and when you get the mic, again, you want to get up close and personal with it. I know it's flu season. I'm sorry about that. Um, if it seems that you are speaking and we can't get it through the mic, Steve may make some sort of indication. And um, I will then ask the person to restate it into the mic. So let me uh, just go over a few other ground rules. Um, so um, I talked about how anybody can call for a division, which means a hand as opposed to a voice. Uh, if you wish to have a paper ballot, we just need to have seven voters from the floor who request a paper ballot. Debate may be cut off by a motion to move the previous question. I'm gonna do whatever I can to avoid having that happen, also known as call the question, so that um, we get to have a full debate. That's the key thing we want here. We want dissent, we want debate, we wanna make sure people have a, a chance to really discuss something. If I'm beginning to see, because in going for and against the article, it seems as if we're being repetitive, I am going to start to indicate giving body language and um, excitement in my voice that perhaps we're ready to move a vote. This will, I'm hoping, avoid calling the question. But anybody at any time can do that. It, is, uh, it, it requires a second, it's non-debatable, and you have to pass it by two-thirds. So it doesn't always save us time. Um, I, all of your uh, remarks should be addressed to me, the moderator. If you call me Madam Moderator, I'll be particularly happy. Um, and, be, and this is a way to avoid having a back and forth between whoever is on the stage, whether it's the school board or the select board, and going back and forth. Um, because truly, 
This is a time for the voters to come together to deliberate. It's a very tragic word, I didn't know this. Deliberate. In deliberating, we lose our liberty. Deliberate. It means that we're trying to weigh and consider several options, yes or no, and when we make a decision, we've lost a little liberty. It's a beautiful thing because law is now more settled. But it's also, it's hard, and, and especially when we're not going to necessarily agree on things. We want to have the time to deliberate, knowing that when we reach a conclusion, we're a little less free than we used to be. But, I would like to say, we're a little more noble. Um, and speaking of that, um, and this is something where perhaps you will want to appeal a moderator's decision. Your speeches must be confined to the merits of the question. You will not be allowed to engage in personal attacks on a member of the body or their motives. And I can give you the chapter verse out of Robert's Rules of Order. This means that when we are, when we are asking questions or debating something, it's got to be very much on what the article is in front of us. If I feel that somebody is saying something and impugning motives to somebody else, I will rule that out of order. Of course, you can appeal the moderator's decision, and then we'll go back to the fun of Robert's rules uh, and what that looks like. But um, I am going to be asking people to, to restate. I have my gavel, and I know I'm talking about Mommy Smash, but my, I, I'm primarily a teacher, so I will be asking people if I feel that they are getting too personal, if they could please restate their concern. I'm always going to believe the concern is valid in such a way that we get to the issue and we're not impugning somebody else's motives. Okay, so um, last piece is sound issues. It's actually pretty good in here. We're, we're, we're wrestling with the fact that this is a big space, it's very live acoustically, and we only have this curtain. If at a certain point it gets very loud on the other side of the curtain, I've asked our um, poll officials to give me some sort of sense that they can't hear. And please, anybody, if you cannot hear because of ambient noise, please let me know and I will use the mic to try and calm things down. But it looks like right now we can hear, so great. So let us begin with Article 1. Has everybody found your articles in your town report? Article 1, to choose all town school district officers required by law to be elected at the annual school district meeting, and that is voting by Australian ballot. Over there. Article 2, to determine what salaries the Putney Town School District will pay its officers and directors. Do we have a motion? I move that the Putney Town School District be authorized to issue vouchers for the payment of its officers and directors for the ensuing fiscal year in the amount of $1,200 each. Oh, so that sounds actually like an amendment. Um, so I'm going to need to just start with the original article. Okay. Yeah, that, I'm sorry, I've never read that one. Okay. So we're going to start with the original article. Yes? Annie, am I correct in that, that that language is incorrect and you were just intending to move the you were just intending to move the article, right? This is the language I have. I know, I think that's so I'm gonna I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna just do a little reverse if that's okay. Yeah. Um, because this is our trial deliberative article. Yes, we can. Um, we are focusing on Article 2, as it was warned, to determine what salaries the Putney Town School District will pay its officers and directors. Do I have a motion? All I need is so moved. Okay, do we have a second? And, and um, could I get the name on the second? Because Kim needs to take this down. I'm sorry, what was the name? Susan Ruggles seconded. And who, who did the motion? Uh, could you say your name? Eileen Shute. 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 Okay. Um, so it, the article has been moved and seconded. 
We are now discussing Article 2 to determine what salaries the Putney Town School District will pay its officers and directors. It sounds like, do we have an amendment? We do. Yes. I move that the Putney Town School District be authorized to issue vouchers for the payments of its officers and directors for the ensuing fiscal year in the amount of $1,200 each. Uh, so in terms of making a, a change to the language of Article 2, um, am I right in hearing that it's in the amount of one thousand dollars? One thousand in the amount of one thousand two hundred dollars each. We are. Do we have a second on the amendment? The second is from Alan Blood. Yes. I have a question. Can we get a runner to Alan Blood? We are now discussing the amendment, and we have our first question, whether it's Maggie or, sorry, Mary? Maddie or Mary? Miriam. Miriam? Marianne. 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 Marianne.
Uh, Lawrence O'Neill. I'm wondering what the current stipend is. Are we raising it? The current stipend is twelve hundred dollars. Could everybody hear that? The current stipend is twelve hundred dollars. Is there somebody who wishes to speak in favor of the amendment? Is there anybody who wishes to speak against the amendment? It appears that we are ready to vote on the amendment. We are now voting on Article 2 amendment uh, to determine what salaries the Putney Town School District will pay its officers and directors in the amount of $1,200. All those in favor of the amendment, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, please indicate by saying nay. It appears that the ayes have it. The ayes have it, and Article 2 passes. Uh, I'm sorry, the amendment passes. Thank you very much, Tom. We are now going to debate Article 2 as amended. Is there anybody who wishes to speak in favor of Article 2 as amended? Is there anybody who wishes to speak against Article 2 as amended? It appears that we are ready to vote. All those in favor of Article 2 as amended, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, please indicate by saying nay. It appears that the ayes have it. The ayes have it, and Article 2 passes. We are now moving on to Article 3. To the extent that the law requires the town school district to vote a Putney Town School District budget at this meeting, the article is as follows. Shall the voters of the school district approve the school board to expend $3,403,070, which is the amount the school board has determined to be necessary for the ensuing fiscal year? It is estimated that, the propo that this proposed budget, if approved, will result in education spending of $17,752 17, per equalized pupil. This projected spending per equalized pupil is 1% higher than spending for the current year. Do we have a motion? So moved. And that is Sergio moved it. Do we have a second? Second. And the second came from Josh. Uh, the article has been moved and seconded. We are now deliberating Article 3. I am going to restate it. Madam Moderator, yes. I put forth an amendment. Uh, we, have an emotion, we have a motion to amend Article 3. Do we have a second? So, I have to, do you want me to finish reading my amendment? Um, yeah, maybe, let's, yeah, sorry. Uh, I'm going to turn it back to you too. Would you like to explain what the amendment is? I put forth an amendment that the budget shall not be implemented unless there is a court order that legally prevents the Wyndham Southeast Unified Union School District from being operational. Okay, can I get some language to that effect? And what, what language are you, you're striking out? Am I understanding that this is striking out to the extent that the law requires? Is this getting added? Yes. This is getting added. Okay, yes. to the entire article. Uh, do we have a second for this amendment? Second is Josh Laughlin. I'm going to read out the whole thing now. The amendment is, so I'm going to read it as it appears plus the amendment. To the extent that the law requires the town school district to, the, to vote a Putney town school district budget at this meeting, the article is as follows. Shall the voters of the school district approve the school board to expend $3,403,070, which is the amount the school board has determined to be necessary for the ensuing fiscal year? 
It is estimated that this proposed budget, if approved, will result in education spending of $17,752 per equalized pupil. This projected spending per equalized pupil is 1% higher than the spending for the current year. The budget shall not be implemented unless there is a court order that legally prevents the Wyndham Southeast Unified Union School District from being operational. So this amendment has been moved and seconded. Is there somebody who wishes to speak in favor of the amendment? In favor of the amendment. Alan, we're going to take questions. Thank you. Can we get a mic? Alan Blood? It's working. It's working? Okay. Um, just so everybody understands what's happening, uh, we, we have this the current proposal is that this budget would not take effect if there was a court order saying that that, excuse me, uh, uh, if, if um, the, what we didn't talk about is if there is no court order, then there will be a unified school district which will set the budget for the school. That's, that's the other thing that we haven't mentioned. So we still will have a budget, just this organization won't decide what that budget is. Some different, different school, school district would decide that. Is that right? Well, uh, there would be a meeting that would decide it, I assume. The board doesn't make the final decision, they make a proposal, and, and they'll hold a meeting with five people there, which will decide that. Is there, is there anyone who wishes to speak in favor of the amendment? Howard. Can we get a mic to Howard? Howard Fairman. You are referring to a legal case here, and you are assuming that the court will render a decision uh, on or before July 1st. Now, judges are sovereign as to when they do whatever they wish, whether it is hearing people in a case or deciding a case. So I'm wondering if you may be painting yourselves into a corner here where you reach July 1st and the court has, and, and nothing has come from the court. Howard, am I right in reading that as against the amendment? You are reading it, which is allowed under Robert's rules, as a question about the amendment. Okay. Thank you. Is there anyone who wishes to speak in favor of the amendment or who wishes to ask a question? Uh, we have a hand in the back. Kate Dodge, can we get somebody back there? And if you could state your name. It's Kate Dodge. I promised I'd keep my mouth shut, but it doesn't work. Um, so there's a lot of assumptions and understanding that goes with this kind of confusing discussion. And I know it could go on forever, and I know you don't want to have things that are irrelevant, but it's hard to know how to vote for this without knowing some of the background. Mm -hmm. And I do read the paper, but it's still a little confusing. Yeah. So I would just like to ask that we get a brief and as clear as possible on a confusing issue uh, background or some of the considerations about the court, uh, et cetera. Is that clear? Yeah. Is there anybody who can answer Kate's question? Alice. So, um, as chair, I'd like to speak to that and I'd like to share a little bit and then I'd like to pass it off to Superintendent Holliday and Business Administrator Frank Rucker to, to flush out. Um, as, I don't know if any of you read your, your report, I assume you do, um, but what I pointed out in the school board report is that we were directed at the end of November um, to merge with Brattleboro, Dummerston, and Guilford, and that those four districts would be unified. We were given guidance but from the Agency of Education not to present a budget to you, and we moved that at our final budget meeting. 
um, at, an, at a following meeting, the school board determined that due to the confusion um, in, in the land and that there had not been a court decision, and I'll, I'll back up a little bit um, for that, but since there was not yet a clear determination, um, we, they, the board decided to go ahead and put in um, the town report a uh, budget that we had previously approved to um, pass over or recommend to the transition board. So just to give you a little bit more of an understanding, 33 districts in the state have sued the state um, to stop Act 46. Um, that's been in the court systems and just recently what we've been waiting to hear is whether there's going to be an injunction and in, what an injunction would have done is to pause our process um, and would have let, allowed the court situation to be flushed out. As of yesterday, um, late in the afternoon, the judge in that court determined that there was no reason to put forth an injunction. Um, so, so right now, it's, it is looking pretty likely that we will be merging on July 1st. There are a lot of people um, who still don't want that to happen, and the courts, um, you know, it's, it's still in play. But we, we have uh, contacted our, so we're in a difficult situation, right? Um, and we have contacted our lawyer a uh, couple of times. We contacted, I contacted him this week and he gave me language which we put forth in the amendment. Um, and then we also spoke to him this morning and he uh, concurred with our approach to go ahead and offer the amendment that he and I had discussed earlier this week. Um, does, does this answer the question enough for why we have this particular amendment? Kate is nodding. Yeah. Okay. So is there somebody who wishes to um, either speak for the amendment? We've been asking questions. Yes, Jean. Oh, sorry. If you could say your name when you get the mic. Mike? We're going to need our mic people to be a little bit more on it. Thank you very much. Is this word? Oh, great. Jean Giddings. Uh, I'd like to speak actually against the amendment. I think the original first line covers the question of whether there is an obligation to present a budget or not to present a budget. And secondly, when you limit it to this budget doesn't take effect unless the court decision comes out, there are other things that could affect it the legislature could act. So I would say we probably have the, uh, the vagaries of whether the merger is going to happen or isn't going to happen covered in the first line and don't need the additional line. And I think the addition of the only if the court does something is probably probably overkill or underkill because there are other things that could change it. Thank you. Great. So we just heard somebody speaking against the amendment. Is there somebody who wishes to speak for the amendment? Can we have another question? And we have another question. Yes. I'm Lionel. Oh, oh sorry. I'm Lionel Chu. And I just wanted to ask if the um, and I think this is relevant. If the um, school board were to change its composition in the next fiscal year, would that uh, enable the town to uh, join the lawsuit and change the future of the decision? How, how does that all work? So Lionel, just, uh, and this is where people may want to overrule me, because we're looking very specifically at the amendment, I think that that may be a question that pertains when we go back to the article. The, the reason this is relevant is yeah. because the, um, the, uh, the point that was just made regarding the amendment was that the language in the first part of the original motion mm -hmm. of, uh, of the person that spoke said that they felt that was adequate mm -hmm. to address the fact that there may be some sort of legal intercession. It, my question has to do with whether or not that's true as far as if we have a different school board, uh, does that play a role as well? So I guess what I need is just a little bit more information before I can even understand whether the last comment was accurate or not. I would suggest we 
pass that to Lyle, who's the superintendent and has been speaking with the lawyer. What we are working, yep, that's fine. What we're working on is to ensure that we have contingency for any eventuality, either legislation, either something through the court. We did hear there's not an immediate injunction, but the court, the judge still needs to rule. So we are hoping that if something happens so that we are not a merged district, then Putney will have a specific budget. However, there's language so that if we are forced to merge, then this budget would be rolled into a merged budget and you would not have a merged budget and an independent Putney budget. Uh, one other thing, if I may say, there was a comment about five members voting on a budget. What would happen in the case of a merged budget is that there would be an annual meeting, all the electorate from all of the towns from Putney, Dummerston, Guilford and Brattleboro would be invited to a meeting and that vote would occur there. Um, so it would not be a board decision. Just a reminder that we are voting, uh, or that we are deliberating the amendment to Article 3. Does anybody wish to speak in favor? I don't think I've heard that yet. Is that, Jamie, would you like to speak in favor of the amendment? I have a point of order. Uh, point of order, yes. Can we get Jamie a microphone? And if you could say your full name. Hi, my name is Jamie Comtois, and I live in Putney. And uh, my point of order was just about uh, Lionel's question, uh, not allowing us to address what was before it. And I also wanted to point out um, that we have not just the legislature that will have the opportunity to address this, but also the Vermont Supreme Court. Great. Um, so I believe we're still looking at the amendment, that's what we're focusing on, uh, is, and I'm looking just to see if we're going to start to move to a vote, is there somebody who wishes to ask a question? Yes. So the, the added to Article 3, the amendment would add this sentence, the budget shall not be implemented unless there is a court order that legally prevents the Wyndham Southeast Unified Union School District from being operational. So that is the amendment, the, that final sentence. Any questions about it? Anybody? Yes. Can, can you um, get, get a mic? Sorry. Tom Herringberg. I don't understand the point of it. I mean, it, if it's to keep option open, it sounds like it closes options. So I, I don't understand. Could somebody just speak to why this amendment? What the point of it is? Thank you. Yep, Maya. Uh, I believe it is to increase the option so that if there is no more, if there is a forced merger, then this budget does not uh, become Putney's budget. It becomes part of the merge budget. If there is something that stops everything so that we continue to be independent school districts, then Putney will have their own school budget. I think those were the, we wanted to make sure there was a, a contingency for either case. Is there anybody who wishes to speak against the amendment? Front here. Hi, um, Eileen Shute. Um, I've been a little confused uh, since this amendment came up, um, and I think I'm beginning to think that it's not um, a wise idea. I think that the, um, the uh, Act 46 as it stands um, will adequately um, address any merged budgets going forward. Probably the court will as well. And I think that this just um, confuses the issue. I think that um, the article was written um, well as it stood. Mm -hmm. okay. Is there anybody who wishes to speak in favor of the amendment? Over there.
uh, Jim Oliver. Uh, just, I think I understood from what was said earlier that the, uh, that this issue was taken to the attorneys uh, responsible for seeing that things are done in a in a uh, reasonable, logical way, and that they recommended this language. Um, I don't see this as being a partisan issue. It's just a a way to get this done in the most effective way. And uh, we can second guess the attorneys, I guess, but I don't think we're, I don't feel in a position to do that. Is there somebody who would like to speak against the amendment? You have a hand in the back. Janice Baldwin. I think it's a really badly worded amendment. That's what's confusing everybody. Uh, something. If what is the negative consequence of our not um, approving this amendment? If we is don't approve the budget today. So did you want to, did you want to yeah, answer, I'm trying, I'm trying to answer, to answer uh, Janice's if, question? Yes. If there is some other kind of stay on Act, the Act 46 merger, we have already have an approved budget and we can keep moving forward smoothly with the school. If it is not stopped and we are required by law to merge, you're saying whether or not you approve of the budget we'd like to send on to the new unified district. And it, I'd like to give a more direct answer to Lionel's question. Um, if I do not know if a change in board composition can cause Putney to join the lawsuit, I do know that we would be allowed to join an appeal. Okay, so we're talking about the amendment. Just to remind everybody, uh, we just heard something in favor of the amendment. Is there somebody who was just to speak against the amendment? We have a hand in the back. Thank you very much. My name is Rich Bowen, and I've served on a school board a while back. <clears throat> we had some big issues, but nothing as big as this. And each year we come to town meeting and we vote on what? It seems today that the way the language of the article is written. And, and we're looking at the amendment right now. We will get to the article. But it amends the article. Mm -hmm. The first part of which says, if we're required by law to pass a budget. And then the second part says, but if Act 46 is set aside, we'll now have a budget because we vote on it. So my question is this. Why don't we come to town meeting and vote on a budget like we've always had? If Act 46 and the law precludes our budget from going forward, so be it. We're in a unified district and there'll be another vote at another time. Why have the language in the beginning suggest that this is just a what if vote and then at the end say, but then what if another time we might need it after all? I suggest we just get rid of the front language and the back language and vote on our budget as we always have. Oh, okay. So, um, is that, are you suggesting another amendment? I, I, I don't want to get two amendments going at the exact same time. My record, and I, I want to make sure, uh, respect what you're saying. Under rules of order, wouldn't we do that after we voted on this one? Yeah, my recommendation definitely would be we're going to just vote on this amendment and then perhaps letting the uh, body know we may have another amendment. Exactly. Okay. And, and just to make sure that I heard you correctly, it is what you just said was against the amendment. Right, great, thank you. Is there somebody who wishes to speak in favor of just the amendment? No, this is so complicated, people. I think what if is absolutely right. We're, we have a lot of what ifs. I'm, oh, sorry, yes. It's not, it's just a moment of clarity. From, mm -hmm. um, while I respect that we got this advice from a lawyer and I do think it simplifies things for us, I think ultimately the gentleman in the back who just spoke is completely correct. We're gonna be directed however we're directed. Um, so we can approve this budget or not in whatever way we want, but um, how we move forward is in any way is, is out of our hands. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think going forward like that is a sensible approach so that we can move on. So that even sounds like against the amendment. I'm just trying to read all this. We have a hand in the back here. Can we get a, a mic to the gentleman in the hat? Hi, 
Robin Ekstrom. Uh, I'm just speaking against the amendment as uh, was previously stated from the floor. I think that the current language is sufficiently clear to cover uh, a number of legal eventualities, and we don't really need to gild the lily with, with the amendment. Uh, one way or another, uh, the current lan language seems to provide either a budget uh, uh, under the current uh, rules where it's from the, uh, our local district or if directed by law, uh, whether by the legislature or the courts, um, at that time we would uh, restate a budget. So I think we're, we're covered without the amendment. Okay. Thank you. So I've just been hearing lots of against the amendment, and I'm beginning to think we may be ready to vote on the amendment. Okay. Oh, we have a hand in the back. Maggie Cassidy, I have a question. If if the voters, uh, with or without the amendment, if the voters uh, approve the school board to expend three million four hundred and three thousand, etc., we have then approved that money. In case of a merger, does that money then go with no to the to the merged? Budget get get subsumed into the merged budget with no further action from the Putney voters. So I'm going to take that as a question. It oh, seems yes, a little bit more it is about a the article itself than particularly the amendment, but it feels like an important question. So if somebody wishes to answer that question, and then I may start moving us more towards the vote on the amendment. It's my understanding that it, it would not um, go the the. The board would, the other board would have to create a new budget. However, what it does is it tells the new board, which would include uh, members of, of this body likely, um, that we support this budget. And there's nothing wrong with that. Okay, so we're starting to move, we're, we're voting on the amendment. I'm going to read the entire thing with the amendment as towards moving towards a vote, unless there's somebody who wishes to speak in favor of the amendment. Is there anybody who wishes to speak in favor of the amendment? Because we've been hearing a lot of uh, cons. Okay, so we are getting ready to vote on Article 3 as amended, which is currently, to the extent that the law requires the town school district to vote a Putney... Just on the amendment, right. So I'm reading it as amended, right? Oh, okay, so, but don't I need to read the entire thing? No, I can just read the amendment? Oh, thank you, okay. So we're just voting on the amendment, thank you, Tom. And it is just this last line. The budget shall not be implemented unless there is a court order that legally prevents the Wyndham Southeast Unified Union School District from being operational. All those in favor of the amendment, please indicate by saying aye. All those opposed, say nay. nay. It appears that the, na that the amendment has not passed. The nays have it. The nays have it. The amendment does not pass. We are now going back to discussing Article 3. Yes. Uh, there's a woman in the front. I'm pausing to see if there's some other amendment. Uh, uh, this is just a question. Um, to what extent do we... Oh, my name is Carolyn Oliver. Um, and this is a question. To what extent does planning for the coming school year involve signing contracts that we might then be responsible for if uh, we are if the merger then it, uh, goes through. So are, would we be committing to things, and was that what that final, was that what the amendment was for, it, to, pre, to prevent us being contracted uh, as a town to some commitments that we made before this all happened? Right, right. Is there somebody who can answer Carol's question? I suggest we ask Lyle Holiday to do that. Okay. So contracts, teacher contracts in particular, are the concern of not having a budget. We cannot offer a formal contract 
unless there is an approved budget. What we will do is offer a letter of intent saying that we are, our intention is once there is a past budget to employ you. Um, there is no precedence for this um, according to our attorney. So his recommendation is that we move ahead, offer the letters of intent, um, knowing that eventually we will have a, an approved budget. Are there any other questions about Article 3? Yes, in the front, Lionel. Well, Lawrence. Lawrence O'Neill. Um, with regard to the spending for equalized people of the 17752, in the past year, we were within about $50 of that penalty rate, and we reduced that by some funding from somewhere. I'm curious to know how close we are to that penalty rate again. Do you have somebody who can answer Lawrence's question? Yeah, let's, um, Frank Rucker can do that. I would love the opportunity just to talk about the budget, if there's one. Yes, um, we are uh, still below the um, threshold, and um, as you see on uh, page 30 in the annual report, um, if we were to update, it's a very small number, it's uh, line 25, excess spending threshold. Um, the, the most recent um, figure that has been recommended by the tax commissioner to the legislature. So again, on page 30, line 25, um, the figure there says excess spending threshold 17,816. They have uh, updated that number to 18,311. And as you noted, um, this hypothetical budget proposes 17,752. So, um, you know, a few hundred dollars less than the, um, than the threshold. Um, is there somebody who wishes to speak in favor of Article 3? And, and uh, Alice, if, if you would like to at this point explain the budget. Okay. Yeah, I am in favor of, of the article. Um, I just want to explain sort of what we've been doing the last year. Um, Last year, we cut. We had to cut a staff position that was a academic support position. We haven't been able to put that position back um, due, due to the high tax rate, um, but it is a level service budget. Uh, we haven't put any new initiatives in, but we're still proud of our programming. Um, we're still driving a strong farm to school program, um, which is one of the things we're known for. That's what's pretty exciting is that we've now done that for several years, as you may remember that we have a great team in the kitchen um, serving really good food and they are all um, paid uh, pretty well. They are not paid hourly, they are on, the vast majority of them are on salary um, with benefit. Yes. Is this on? Yeah. yeah. Um, so just heads up about that. Um, what is exciting, as I was about to say, is that we are, um, our, our sort of startup expenses for that are going lower and lower. So we're now having, we're able to cut money out of that budget, um, which is exciting. Um, this year we are planning to get a freezer up and running um, in the back of the kitchen. And, and I would love, uh, May, to turn this over to, to her. For, our principal in a moment so he can speak to some stuff. Um, but we did get a 15,000 grant from that for that freezer. And so hopefully in the next couple of months we'll get that off the ground. Um, we are, I wanna give a shout out to Benji Cragen who was the chair of this board. For several years he and his team of board members and a couple other people um, put together a three year energy um, initiative. Um, with, a, with some new roofs and a pellet boiler. And we're totally on target, target to getting, reaching the gains from that um, and spending less money, not buying oil. Um, we have, as you might know, have had some serious quirks with the pellet boiler, um, which has been un very unfortunate. The pellet boiler that the previous board put in uh, recently had to go away in the back of a truck 
um, it was not working at all. Um, so we got a new pellet boiler and we did that without having to spend any money, which is uh, something we can all be very happy about because it would have been quite expensive. And, and the thanks for that uh, go to Frank Rucker, who spent a tremendous amount of money getting, getting grants um, for that um, and her at his side. So we actually have excess grant money from that project. Um, but that's been a rickety couple of, it's been a bummer, but Benji, it's turning out okay. <laughs> um, other than that, I would just turn people's attention. You know, we can go line by line. If you do go line by line, what you'll see is that um, pre things are pretty stable in terms of, you know, we haven't made, as I said earlier, dramatic cuts. Healthcare is just skyrocketing. Um, uh, payroll is what percentage of our budget? It's quite high. It's about 60% for salaries and then another 20% for benefits. So as you can imagine, those are budget lines we really can't touch unless we cut positions. But other than that, Herb has just sort of pulled money out of lines where he thought he could. Um, if you go to page 30, um, again, this is a hypothetical budget. It really is, to some degree, a, always a hypothetical budget, even in a non-Act 46 year, because we have to wait for the legislature um, to give us information. But what, they, what the tax commissioner recommended to the legislature as the base, the yield, which is, I consider the yield is just sort of what, what they assume we will basically pay for education and then what we raise here, what we decide to raise is on top of that. Um, so they gave us 1066 as that figure. Um, the school board at, recommends a $3,400,000 budget, uh, basically. Um, and then we're, we've got an estimate of 180 students, um, and that's an equalized number. That's just a basement, uh, uh, that's an average of the two previous years. And an equalized pupil number is a weighted calculation of students. All students are not counted equally. High school kids are more expensive than um, pre-K kids. And so, so that's what that number is. Um, so that will change. Um, then our prorated tax rate is 1.664, and as you guys know, there's a very complicated formula here in Vermont to figure out what we ultimately pay, and part of that is due to the common level of appraisal, and the common level of appraisal this year is what? It's 99.7, so that's down from, you want that number to be pretty high, and this year it's down, um, so you, um, so our property taxes are going up. Again, we don't know exactly how much they will go up because that depends on some numbers that will come our way from the state, um, but it looks like we'll be over 1%. But that's pretty, that's pretty good. So why don't we start with, are there any specific questions about Article 3? And then we're going to go into uh, pros and cons. Hand right there, the woman with the shawl. Hello. Uh, hi, my name is Jessica Lindorfer. Um, a couple months ago, her floated the idea that. If you oh. can get the mic a little closer to your yeah. mic. Thank you, Jesse. Okay. Um, that the school is looking into a pre K 3 program, and I don't see that included in the budget, so I just wanted to see if I'm correct in my assumption that that's not included in the budget, and wondering if what, what the impact would be if that was, and maybe some explanation about what happened. Thanks. Can, can I start by saying we really wanted that to happen um, and we worked hard and we applied for grants. When we built that in the budget, which we asked Frank Rucker and Herve to do, it was an astronomical cost. So, um, and I, Herve should, we really think that should happen and by conversations that are happening in Montpelier, I think that ultimately may happen, um, but for us to, do, yeah. For us to do that on our own would really, people would not be able to pay their property taxes, honestly, some of them. So, but I'm gonna ask her to speak a little bit about that. Sure, um, thank you. So absolutely, um, in theory, 
and in, in uh, deep-seated beliefs here at Botany Central, and I think in, throughout the community. The pre-K early learning uh, environment is something that has been wholeheartedly endorsed since we started the preschool six, seven years ago now. Um, it's expensive because of uh, regulations that govern uh, preschool environments, such as always needing to have two people uh, in the room at all times, et cetera, et cetera. So we do some jockeying with personnel and so forth. I did apply for a grant a little late uh, in the game with that, I guess. We, we got turned down for a $30,000 grant. Uh, it doesn't mean we can't go back to that. But overall, you know, you can expect to spend between 130 to 150, roughly 1,000, depending on personnel, where they're at in terms of salary scales and so forth, to run the program. And the reason we didn't include it was that um, it would have put us over the budget threshold and into the penalty. So that's why we didn't do it this year. The good news is that we know that there's a number of kids in the pipeline for preschool. We have a full enrollment next year of, of 16 and two on the waiting list. So that's very encouraging for future enrollment of, the, of Putney Central. Do we have any other questions? Yes, in the front. Yeah, Reed Miller. Can you uh, use Reed Miller's name? I want to know why we're not backing the stoop to stop this. I mean, the only thing I've seen out of this Act 46 is that we're giving up control of our school and our children's education to the district. And uh, this is all state dictated. So why don't we just have our elected school board hold the vote? If we say no, write them a letter, tell them we will not be participating and go from there and support this, this uh, suit that is, that is trying to stop this. Because I fear that by giving up control of the school, you're going to be giving up you know, your curriculum, you're going to be giving up the education of the children in the town of Putney to the district. And as I understand it, your committee is going to be eight people, two from Brattleboro, two from Gilbert, two from Dummerston, and two from Putney, who understood what they told me at the Slugman's meeting the other night. So now, rather than the town of Putney dealing with the town of Putney, we're going to be one, one quarter of the board when the board meets in Brattleboro, or wherever they meet. So I'm just, I'm just wondering why we're in such a, such a jump to give away our children's educations. So, um... <laughs> So, Mr. Mr. Miller, I'm going to read that as maybe against Article Three, um, and and as which is completely right. This is the time for us to have the conversation about Article Three as it is as it is presented. Um, so, did you also have a question in in in, in your statements? Yes. Why aren't we involved in the students? So, why aren't we involved with the students? I don't know. Is that a question that can be answered? Sorry, why aren't we involved in this suit? Thank you. Someone never suggested at the board level that we would do that. No one ever put forth a motion for that. Do you ever talk to So, sorry, I'm going to, um, yeah, okay. Uh, the school board's elected, you have constituents. Do you ever talk to them? I mean, I've had, a, I've had a great deal of conversation with people that I know in town, and basically, it's negative. We don't want some, I'll be nice, person from Vermont telling Putney what to do in their school. This is our school, our students, our budget. So why should we give it away? What, what advantage is there to us? Are we going to, are we looking at a, a 10 to 20 percent discount on our taxes for this you just said taxes are going up they usually do but what do we stand to gain from this the the people the children this is our building and we're giving it away so that thank you is and, there somebody who wishes to answer um mr miller's question here so you know, I, I'm running for school board, so I have to be careful about how I articulate an answer to this. I will say that, um, and I, I think Frank could speak speak to this well. Um, there are certainly people on this board 
who would be in favor of, of stopping this and doing whatever they could to stop it. I will say that from where I've been sitting, what people, what, well, I'll, I'll start by saying complying with this is the law, and school board members swear an oath of office to comply with law. And at the same time, I will say that through all of what's been going on the last several years, what I've understood people to want most of all is for a s school to remain in town. And from my work over the last several years, that is what I've been focused on. Um, can we pass it off to uh, Can I have Is, it, is it all right if he answers your question? Yeah. Yes. Go for it. Go ahead. I, I, I would only add to what Alice just said uh, that um, you know your question relates to a, a process issue. Um, this started in 2015 when um, Act uh, 46 was passed. It was based on findings that um, that had to do with increasing educational opportunity for students. And as you I'm sure know, uh, there was a two-year period um, uh, engaged in. Um, and, and very well represented in terms of Putney's uh, um, board delegation to a study committee. It, it would have been at that, at the, in that two-year process that if this was not in the best interest of students, as, you, as you're making this, you know, the central point, um, I, I do believe the study committee would have found that it, that it is not in increasing educational opportunity and not assuring that this school here would continue um, to, to operate and, and improve on what it has already done very well. So um, there was opportunity all along. Those are all public process uh, meetings. Um, and and I, I, would, I would say that um, as other folks have shared, you know, anyone can take an initiative into the future, uh, but in terms of uh, the due diligence of complying with the law and then finding uh, what is the impact on student opportunity uh, that this is a favorable direction to move in um, is is why we're here today. So I, ha I have uh, another hand up in the back, but first uh, a member of the school board, Andy Beekman, is asked to respond to Mr. Miller's question. Is that okay? Yeah. Mr. Miller. I support joining the lawsuit. I just want you to know that. So we have a hand in the back. Can we get a mic to the hand in the back, please? Jamie Contois Putney. Uh, it's my understanding that the reason uh, that we are not a part of the lawsuit is because the five-person board has three voting members who uh, support proceeding uh, with the merger on the current board of directors and that there are only two people and so they were outvoted and so that there was not a consideration. Even though 68% of us in the town of Putney voted against proceeding with the merger, uh, we have a school board that is three to two for the merger. So I'm, I'm, I'm uh, just wanting to remind everyone that we're talking about Article 3. Um, and we have a hand here by, right, oh, sorry, can you turn around? Aisle person, sorry, you forgot your name. Thank you, Alan Moses Putney. I just want to address what Mr. Rucker said about the process because I believe he didn't uh, completely uh, illustrate the process. While there was a two-year process, um, the, and as uh, Alice said, it is a law, but um, the law is a very complex law. Act 46 had then been amended with Act 49. Um, the law had um, structures within it to um, address various ways of meeting the goals. One of those was to establish an alternative governance structure. Um, 
I did attend several meetings. Um, there was a full steam ahead with only one aspect of meeting the goals of Act 46. There was not much process around other ways to meet the stated goals of Act 46. Thank you. So just to remind everybody, we're discussing Article 3 um, about the school budget. We have a hand here. Josh Lopp, I'm sorry. Um, I just don't see how this is germane to Article 3. Um, and I understand that people want to discuss Act 46, and I think that's totally legitimate. It has nothing to do with Article 3, and I think in the interest of town meeting moving forward, I would recommend that we avoid that, please. Okay. Yeah. So just a reminder to everybody, we can only discuss what is on the article, um, but we have a hand here. Uh, oh. Sorry, I've Go got the microphone. Uh, I, I, I'd, like to, um, I'd like to bring us back to Article 3 as well, and, and I'd like to speak in favor of it. Uh, it's obvious that we have to have a budget. Mm -hmm. um, there was a comment made earlier about the idea of stripping the article from the first uh, phrases. Um, I, I personally don't think it's necessary, and I, I would suggest that we simply vote on Article 3 as it currently exists. So I'm hearing no amendment suggested. Great. Uh, so that's something in, in favor of Article 3. We have a hand in the back. Tom Amber, uh, I have t two questions. Um, the first is, is this, is this budget, in terms of the final figure, because that's really what we're hopefully going to get to work with, substantially different whether or not we merge. In other words, if, if the merger goes ahead and the new unified district, uh, this, is, this is our recommendation to the unified district, if the unified district forms in April. If it does not, for some reason, is, is this essentially the same budget either way? That's question one. Question two is on page 24. The Asian Studies program seems to uh, have been reduced by 100%. Uh, is that no longer happening? That's my question. Thank you. So we have two questions. Can I suggest Herb answer and then pass it to Frank? OK. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a stab at both of those, and then Frank can elaborate more fully if he'd like to on the budget question. Um, we begin budget consideration and conversations, believe it or not, right around the 1st of October. And so the guidance um, that I had in, in working uh, with Frank and Lyle to pull the budget together was to say, hey, look, let's put this budget together as if it's like any other year, we're just going to move forward with our own budget and put together the best program that we can for the kids. So that's the idea behind the level funding of, um, excuse me, level servicing of the program. The second question about the Asian studies. The Asian studies um, line item was really sort of a legacy um, issue that goes back to roughly the mid to late 90s when we had the program here with exchanging teachers. Uh, when I first started here a number of years ago, there was a few teachers who came uh, from Japan, from Thailand, from China, and a few of our folks went over there for lengths varying uh, from a few weeks in the summer to uh, semester and longer experiences. So the primary funding for that program came from the Freeman Foundation. And as you know, Freeman, uh, very, very generous folks, but like any grantor, what they like to do is to see the program be taken up by the grantees, right? So if they were throwing, say, I don't know how much it was at the district level, let's just say hypothetically it was, you know, $100,000. Over time, they would be each year adding less and less to that number in the hopes 
that there would be value and opportunity found within the district to support the program. So, most recently, our contribution to that went to um, Chinese uh, language, which we haven't, uh, we haven't continued this year in that form. When we weren't paying a portion of a teacher, so. Can you hear me? Um, well, I think it was, a, it was a value proposition, to be quite honest. We had the one language which was um, Chinese that we were able to offer for foreign language. Uh, thanks to technology, we were able to learn to uh, rather take advantage of online learning opportunities for kids that expanded the opportunity from one language to six. Uh, we happen to have a skilled uh, person who's sort of proctoring that experience for about eight or ten kids right now. And that's worked out just great. So that's the long-winded answer. <laughs> and the second question is going to be able to be answered? Sure. Um, so your, your question regarding um, if, if we pass a budget in this format versus um, subject to the, the change in governance. And, uh, my, my answer to your question is to say that um, the, the funding mechanism for school budgets has not changed. Um, so the, uh, the, the general process of uh, budget being approved by the electorate uh, and then uh, it would be me who would report that result to the Agency of Education um, is then interpreted by the tax department and all of the funding laws and ultimately turned into a school uh, property tax rate that's sent back to the select board. Um, so the, the, the point is that um, if we follow our traditional uh, form of governance, um, then this action would, um, would proceed and funding and budget implementation would be as it has always been since 1996. Um, if we go to the merged, format, uh, same process in that there does need to be uh, a board warning a budget to the electorate. If the electorate uh, approves that budget, um, we then, again, I, I report that to um, the agency of ed. Um, and I think maybe part of your question is, uh, does this 3,403 specifically get inserted um, into the merged entity? Um, and I can't speak for the, the future board, um, uh, but I would say that, as, as you know, as Herb just said, and as Alice has just said, the deliberation for specific programs at this school um, are, are very well articulated, and um, that is the obligation of the transition board to consider um, the proposals. Uh, if. Putney Town electorate approves this, I believe it will increase the um, sort of the credibility of, of uh, what is expected um, for public education. Uh, so all, all I can say is it seems highly likely, but it is subject to this um, final process. So um, we are discussing Article 3. Um, it would be great if we could vote on this prior to lunch, perhaps. I'm just going to put that out there. Um, is there anybody who wishes to speak? I think we heard in favor of Article 3. We've heard many, many questions. Is there anybody who wishes to speak against Article 3? Uh, I, Emily. Can we get Emily up the mic? And if you could say your name, please. Emily Payton in Putney. And I'm taking this opportunity to speak to those who are opposed to Act 43 and this uh, Article 3, just to inform you that statewide, a nonpartisan league is forming that may be able to address these things. And you can see me afterwards. Thank you. Um, is there somebody who wishes to speak in favor of Article 3? <laughs> Uh, we'll go there then. Thank you, Madam Moderator. My name is Rich Bowen. I addressed the, the town earlier with respect to the amendment, and now <clears throat> I'd like everyone to look at the article as it is written. There is a preamble to it in bold, and I know this is recommended by the town attorney. However, 
Um, it suggests that to the extent required by law is something that opens up a can of worms for any lawyer, and I am a lawyer, and I look at that language and say, I don't want to see this in any article. I want to vote on a budget. I want to vote on a budget today, and I want to take out the preamble. And the reason for that is that school teachers who are offered their letter of intent, whether there's a court ruling or not, are going to proceed in the same manner that they always have year after year based upon the budget that we have adopted at this town. And Rich, can I stop you for one quick sure. second? So I'm hearing you that you are making an amendment to strike the preamble. That's correct. Um, Forgive me for that's okay. speaking in favor of my amendment before. Yeah, that's okay. So I have an amendment to strike the, pre if you could stop for a second, to strike the preamble of Article 3. Do we have a second? We have a second, and could you say your name, please? Steve Anderson. Steve Anderson, second. Uh, we now are debating the amendment, which has been moved and seconded, and we are now moving to uh, deliberation, and I'll hand it back to you. To Forgive explain. me for my breach of Robert's rules. That's but fine. <clears throat> what, what I do suggest, though, is that we proceed as we always have. Um, I know that there's uncertainty. And when there's uncertainty with a court, whether it's a ruling that the police have to follow, the school board has to follow, any government agency has to follow, we stick to what we have always done. Because if that ruling is that the, the, the legislation is not going to go forward or the legislature, in their wisdom, decides to change it, there's at least a basis for a budget in this town that the teachers and the board and the administration can rely upon for contractual basis. So I would like to see this removed and remove any possible, um, 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 I guess it would be confusion as to how we voted today. There has to be a vote and it has to be a vote on a budget. Okay, so we are now voting on, we are now deliberating on the amendment. Is there somebody who wishes to speak against the proposed amendment, which is to strike the preamble from Article 3? Uh, we have a question. Okay, so um, <laughs> we were almost close, I think, to voting on the budget. Um, this is confusing the issue, I think, a little bit. Um, so what I'd like to know from the school board is where this language came from. Was it statutorily um, required, or was this something that was recommended by the lawyer? Um, did it come down from the state uh, the Department of Education? Because um, I'm assuming that it was in there for a reason. Great. Is there someone who can answer? Yeah. So we were directed not to put a budget. Sorry. We were directed not to offer a budget to you, um, but the school board decided to go ahead and put it in. So the our lawyer recommended this language. Okay. Does that answer your question? Uh, is there somebody who wishes to speak against? Because that wasn't against. That was the question. Is there somebody who wishes to speak against the amendment? We have a, in back, Howard. We have a question. First, a point of order. Uh, there is actually no amendment on the floor because it has not been seconded. Oh, it was it was seconded by Steve Anderson. Okay, thank you. I didn't notice that. But um, good to pay attention. Thank you very much. Uh, my question I would like to ask to the person who moved the amendment, who identifies himself as an attorney. Uh, what, sir, is the legal effect of your amendment? Thank you. The legal effect of this amendment is to have the Putnam Town School District vote on a budget today. Whether that budget is our budget in the future depends on many things. And it may be that we don't get to vote eventually because if there's a unified school district, then there'll be another vote and it will be superfluous. However, because it says that to the extent that the law requires, that is a phrase that is filled with ambiguity. And I don't want to pass a budget filled with ambiguity. I would also mention that because the way the article was phrased by our attorneys, 
the actual language that remains does not identify the Putnam Town School District, it just identifies the school district. So to the extent that I made an amendment to remove the old um, language, which is the preamble, I believe, and it's been pointed out to me, that we do need to make this article specific to the Putney Town School District. So, uh, just from a parliamentary procedure, I, I think we should handle each of these amendments one at a time. Uh, so we are just debating the amendment of striking out the preamble. Is there anybody who wishes to speak um, in f against striking the preamble? No. Does anybody wish to speak? Oh, Mr. Miller? I, we, this is a strike, striking the preamble. Yes, striking the preamble. Uh, I think to avoid all the confusion that's gone on here today, in future, I think every school budget should be subjected to Australian ballot. Everybody will have time to read it, consider it, everybody in town. And I must say, this is a good representation for town meeting, but it's a far cry from the number of voters in the town of Putney. But every voter would have a say if it were on Australian ballot, and we wouldn't have all this confusion. So I'm going to take that as, as, a, as a possible for future town meetings, but right now we're just focusing on striking the preamble. Right. Well, all this, all this back and forth over, over a few words would be, would be taken care of because you would put forth a budget and we would decide whether we wanted it. And okay. if we didn't, you could come back with an, with an, another one. Okay, great. It's uh, uh, the enforced bed, this one. So we are, I, I'm wanting if anybody wishes to speak against, otherwise I think we're going to start to move towards a vote. We have a question in the back. Yes. Can we get a microphone to Liz? Where is, yeah. Uh, Liz Adams. Um, in reference to what Mr. Bowen said, uh, the Vermont Attorney General's office sent out a statement that the board was made aware of that, yes, we can vote on a budget for the town of Putney without all of this other stuff thrown in. So I just want to clarify that. that um, Great. And so I'm hearing that as in favor of striking the preamble. Yes. Um, is there anybody who wishes to speak against striking the preamble? In which case, I think that we are ready to vote on the amendment. We are, we are now voting on the amendment, which would be to strike the preamble of Article 3. All those in favor of striking the preamble, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, please indicate by saying nay. It appears that the ayes have it. The ayes have it, and the amendment passes. We are now turning back to Article 3 and discussing Article 3 with, you can mark it up on your, on your uh, town report. It begins, shall the voters of the school district approve the school board to expend 3,403,070? And we have, yes. Moderator, I, I would like to make an amendment to that. The first line should read, shall the voters of the Putney Town School District. Did, could anyone hear me? Can you say that one more time? The amendment would read, shall the voters of the Putney Town School District, the purpose of the amendment being to be specific as to which school district. Okay. And do we have a second? Can we just get a name for who was the second? <laughs> um, so the amendment has been moved and seconded. We are now discussing shall the voters of the Putney Town School District approve the school board and it continues along in the same way. Is there somebody who wishes to speak in favor of this amendment? Yes. I think it's a great idea. <laughs> great. Wow. So now it looks like do we have anybody who wishes to speak against this amendment? It appears that we may be ready to vote on the amendment. 
We are now voting, shall the voters of the Putney Town School District approve the school board to expend $3,403,070, etc. All those in favor of the amendment, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, please say nay. It appears that the ayes have it, the ayes have it, and the amendment passes. We are now turning back to Article 3, as amended. Has everybody marked up their town report? Um, the preamble is gone and we have inserted this new language, Putney Town, before school district. Are we ready to vote on the budget? I'm seeing some nodding. We have a hand in the back. I want to eat lunch, so sorry. But um, Jamie Putney, um, one question I had was in the research I did leading up to today, I was noticing that tax rates were increasing um, in merged districts and that there are additional costs that are added to budgets as you merge, as you have to hire centralized administrators in order to allow for the uh, process. And so I was wondering um, how that is reflected in the current budget, the cost of the administrators or centralized staff that are needed for the merger in this budget. And if they aren't, uh, how will we get to decide how we proceed with those incurred costs if the merger proceeds? Do we have an answer for Jamie's question? Right, so this is a Putney Town School District budget, so any merger costs would not be in this budget. Um, I'm not aware of mergers, merged districts budgets being higher, um, so I'm not going to speak to that. Um, the merged district, I imagine, will have budget lines for further assistance. I will say that because the 2017 a merger vote went down, which was for a consideration for a different set of articles. There was in that one hundred and fifty thousand um, dollar, not a grant, but um, transition grant that uh, the new merge district would get, um, and that will not be the case um, with the new unified union district that, as of right now, has been directed to merge on the July first. But Frank, do you want to speak? Maybe just briefly, and that is again going back to the legislative findings. They studied, they studied the um, uh, the effects of streamlining governance structures, creating uh, more collaborative um, regional planning for curriculum, for student programming, um, addressing the transitions between you know, sixth grade, eighth grade, uh, and and the high schools, and in their analysis. Uh, they found just the opposite of what you had indicated, which is um, that it is a more efficient structure and able to reduce costs. I think you're, you're correct that there will be these one-time costs uh, to set systems up, um, and, uh, but the, 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 the savings through the efficiencies over time will uh, substantially outweigh um, those initial costs. Uh, maybe one other comment, and, and that is because the State Board of Ed left the supervisory union um, in place uh, under this uh, proposed um, governance structure in Wyndham Southeast, um, we don't expect there will be any additional administrative uh, costs. We will have to re uh, redirect our focus to obviously set systems up um, so that the new entity can operate, but. Um, at this point, there I, I don't expect to see additional costs. So we're going to be voting on Article 3 as amended. We have, yes? Oh, uh, before, actually, because I couldn't actually hear that, I'm going to say it looks like we're getting ready to vote. Um, I'm going to say we are ready to vote on Article 3. No, we have one other hand in the back. Hi, I'm Kathleen O'Reilly, and I wanted to ask you, Alice, why is it that we were asked... Oh, sorry, you're going to have to use the mic, Kathleen. Okay. Um, I thought I heard you say that it was recommended that we not vote on a budget today? Yes. And that you not bring a vote, uh, you not bring a budget to us. 
Can you tell me why that is? Because right now, per law, we've been directed to merge on July 1st. So as of right now, this district on July 1st will not be an active district. So this is in lieu of, if that does not happen for various reasons, this would right. be our budget, and we would not have to meet again. Correct. Okay, thank you. So it looks like we're getting ready to vote on Article 3. Um, nope, I have one more hand up here. Uh, Susan Nephew, uh, just follow up on that question um, or that answer. What happens to if we vote for this $35 million? <laughs> Three million. Three hundred and <laughs> right. Thirty-three million dollars. <laughs> what if um, we vote for it and then that happens in July? And what happens to the money that we designated towards that? As far as we don't have a nice dinner somewhere. somewhere. Um, no, I, I would imagine that we will get uh, very clear advice and direction from the Secretary of State's office and the, the Agency of Education. So I think all will be well. Are we ready to vote? Because otherwise, I think we're going to. I'm going to give the mic to. Yes, I would like to call the question. You would like? Okay. All right. So the, the we need a second. Second. Uh, can I get a name for a second? Eileen. Eileen. Uh, and uh, the calling the question was. I'm sorry. Can you say your name? Jessica Lindorfer. Uh, okay. The question has been called and seconded. It is non-debatable. We need a two-thirds majority. So, we are now voting on calling the question. All those in favor of calling the question, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, please indicate by saying nay. I think two thirds just happened. The question has been called. We are now moving to a vote on Article 3 as it was amended. Uh, um, and I'm supposed to read it for, but right before the vote. Shall the voters of the Putney Town School District approve the school board to expend $3,403,070, which is the amount the school board has determined to be necessary for the ensuing fiscal year? It is estimated that this proposed budget, if approved, will result in education spending of $17,752 per equalized pupil. This projected spending per equalized pupil is 1.0% higher than spending for the current year. All those in favor of Article 3 as amended, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, please indicate by saying nay. It appears that the ayes have it. The ayes have it, and Article 3 passes as amended. Thank you so much. We are now moving on, if it's okay, to Article 4, so that we can finish up school before lunch. Um, we have a hand up before I move to Article 4? Yeah. Um, we're giving you a mic. Uh, Madam Moderator, uh, Robin Ekstrom, uh, uh, would it be in order or acceptable for me to uh, make a motion from the floor? Um, I guess. Briefly. Briefly. Uh, I would just like, uh, like to move uh, to thank our school administrators and um, our school board for preparing this budget despite the uh, recommendation from the state so that we are prepared in the event of all eventualities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> Article 4 to transact any other school business that may legally come before the annual school district meeting. Yes, in the back, Howard. Ms. Moderator, I would like to offer a point of information about pending legislation on further school district consolidation. Mm -hmm. When uh, some of us uh, were invited to meet with our state representatives at the library Sunday, Representative, Representative Morwicki told us that there is now legislation pending before the Vermont General Assembly, which instructs the Vermont Commissioner of Education to uh, propose and plan a single school district for the entire state of Vermont 
to take effect in 2023 so that we will be governing our schools as they do in Hawaii. Uh, the, the bill is H.488. Have a look at it. Great, thank you. Is there any other school business that may legally come before the annual school district meeting? It appears that we are ready to recess for lunch. Oh. Uh, and I'm, I wasn't going to, I'm looking at my parliamentarian, I wasn't going to adjourn one meeting and, and announce another meeting, but take a, a lunch recess. Yep, okay, Here, seeing no objections. Oh, did you have another legally business before the school district? Is it a legal business to inquire whether the school board is looking at the concerns and the health concerns of wireless in the classrooms? Is that a legal issue that I may bring up now? It's up to the town, or if there's anything that can be briefly reported to the town? No? The school board is not, but perhaps the principal has something to say about that. Wow. Um, thank you. Uh, um, it's not something that's come up recently. I mean, in the course of our daily lives here at school, we pay attention to some of the fundamental uh, infrastructure issues, water, um, safe playgrounds, etc., etc., parking lot being in reasonable shape, not so great today. Um, but it is certainly something if people wanted to form a little committee to sort of look at something like that, I'd certainly be open to that. Okay. Yes, Alice. Can I just add one? Mm -hmm. We have some retirements that I'd like to make note of. Um, I'm sorry. So we have some retirements that I should have mentioned earlier. Arlene Scott has been with us. She's our school nurse. After 11 years, she is retiring. Um, Hannah Van Loon has been with us how many years? many years, <laughs> many years, uh, is also leaving, um, and she's putting her, her hard work. And uh, Ruth Schultz, who has worked uh, in the classroom and also uh, helping clean the school after something like 24 years is, is leaving. And they, they will all be missed, and we, we wish them joy doing whatever they're gonna be doing. Great. Great. Yes? Um, just a quick one. If you're interested at all in taking a peek at the new pellet boiler, which I'm pretty excited about. Um, it's Austrian. It is Austrian. And, and it, um, superb engineering. In any case, I'll be right over here by the entrance, and if you'd like to do that, I'm happy to show, show you around. Uh, hearing no objections, I would like to invite Karen Astley, Alyssa Harlow, and Kim Monroe to join us. These are non Putney residents who are doing important town work. So I am inviting them to the stage unless I hear any objections. Putney residents get all sorts of privileges. And one of those is to sit in this area. So I just want to remind everybody that if you are not a Putney resident, if you would please sit on the other side of the chain. We will still care about you. However, you may not speak unless you have been given permission because we want to hear from you. That's the way we run things in Putney. So just as a reminder, for people who are speaking during the deliberation, it's for residents of Putney unless you've been invited in and Putney residents will sit here within the chain. Before I turn it over to the select board, I just wanted to go over a few more fun rules from Roberts. Um, and this will be important as if we're hoping to get out of here before dinner time. Um, after you've spoken once on a particular article, you will not be recognized a second time during discussion on that article or amendment until all other voters who wish to speak on the issue for the first time are given an opportunity to do so. Robert's rules only allows a given speaker to speak twice on a given motion and limits the duration of speeches to 10 minutes. So this will be something that limits our discussion. Uh, besides Robert's rules, 
The other authority is Vermont statute. And um, I want to remind people, I mentioned this this morning, but because there is some confusion of the material that was uh, included in the town report around Robert's town meeting glossary, I want to clarify that you, when we are debating an issue that does not actually get voted on, which is an issue that's taken care of through Australian ballot, and we have a couple this afternoon, if it has to do with elections, we do not discuss anything having to do with elections. However, this is from, and thank you Howard Fairman for pointing this out, uh, Vermont Statute Title 17, Section 2640, Subsection C1, public discussion of ballot issues and all other issues appearing in the warning other than election of candidates shall be permitted at the annual meeting regardless of the location of the polling place. So there's an, L, uh, an article, Article 8, which we will discuss. However, we will not deliberate. I will not be asking for pros and cons because we will not be voting on it as a body. We are voting individually behind the curtain. The other clarification I wish to make is that it suggests on page 93 that only the moderator may ask for a voice, I'm sorry, for a hand count after a voice vote. In fact, anybody from the floor, if you feel that I have misread the voice vote, you may call division or ask for a hand count. And then we will do that instead of the voice vote if you do it ahead of time or afterwards to clarify how the voters voted. I think that's all I need to get us going for another exciting adventure in democracy. It's very nice to work with you all. And I'm now going to turn it over to the select board who, before I read an article five, has a few select board announcements. That's your cue. Sorry, yeah. Uh, thanks. Uh, just a few things we wanted to do. Um, we wanted to, sorry, that doesn't want to go up. Um, clarify a couple things from the town report. One, just a recognition of the, uh, the, the community barn is in fact named the Laura Heller community barn and we wanted to acknowledge that that was part of the recognition was also um, in remembrance of Laura Heller. Um, we also wanted to um, just say thank you again as is printed in the uh, in the town report to Next Stage and all of those who participate in making it such a lively part of our community and how important it has been both as a venue and as an economic driver for the village, et cetera, um, and how important that is, and we're very grateful for that. Um, um, and then uh, also you saw, and this is a divergence from past history, but um, that we recognized Lisa Papazian and Betsy McIsaac as our persons of the year. Neither of them, I believe, are here today because we probably all know where they are. Uh, um, and I just want to say how amazing it is what they've taken on at the general store. And again, speaking of you know economic drivers for the town of Putney and how important it has been. And I know they both would love to turn the reins over to somebody else if anybody is looking. Um, but that they have been such valuable and important participants in the whole process of keeping the general store alive. So really want to thank them for that. Um, and I also, before we get too far, want to thank Steve Head for, he. this is his last meeting. Um, he has done six years with us on the select board and has been a very valuable member, uh, always a, a level head and always a good, voice when we need it, um, and, and uh, I just want to acknowledge Steve's work and thank him very much for his six years of service.
Um, and then, Karen, there, there were, it was, as all, you, all of you know, quite a transitional year in town hall this year. Um, there are uh, a few corrections um, in the town report that Karen wants to just point out. Also, I just, for those of you who don't, Karen Astley, you know, because she's been here now for over a year, um, but also her administrative assistant, um, Alyssa Harlow, has been a tremendous addition to the office in Putney and uh, helps with all sorts of things, keeping Karen in line. In line. So we did misspell some names in the book, and um, we do sincerely apologize for that. Also on page 38, in the general fund budget, um, just below town clerk's office. So total public safety, that entire line actually belongs at the bottom of the page. So those are the totals for public safety. That's page 38. Page 41 in the highway budget. The very last item, subtotal, that needs to go under insurance for the 14,400. On page 42, highway budget, Winter maintenance. The subtotal lines, the totals are not there. I'm going to give you those figures right now. Is everyone ready? So the first item is $198,759. The second item is $181,000. 569. The third item is negative $17,190. The fourth item is $199,055. And the last column reads $208,000. There was one miscalculation in the library budget on page 45. Under maintenance and utilities, the fourth line over, second line up from the bottom, should read $17,220.50. And none of those um, errors change. Oh, that number is 17,000. Page 45. In maintenance and utilities, the fourth column over, instead of 24,920 in between the two lines there, should be $17,220. Those numbers do not change the bottom line in any of those budgets. And I have double checked this more than once. <laughs> and, and that's all the corrections. I, I, we, I just, we, we have plaques, and since they're not here, we won't give them, but we have plaques for both Betsy and Lisa recognizing their town hall. Okay. 
Um, I'm fussing a little bit with my microphone to make sure that I can read and stay off my feet a little bit, but if, if you have a difficulty with me, uh, with my speaking, please let me know and I'll adjust. Uh, we are now going to move on to Article 5, to choose all town officers required by law to be elected at the annual town meeting, voting by Australian ballot. Article 6, to see if the town will accept the minutes of the last town meeting. Do I have a motion to approve? I know there may be some corrections, but do we have a motion to approve? Yes, Eva, is a motion to approve. Do we have a second? Is it Robert? Robert, what was your last name? Robin. Robert, Robin Estrom. Sorry. Uh, so it has been moved and seconded to, to accept the minutes. Um, are there any corrections? Yes. Thank you. Um, I'd like to um, <coughs> note some corrections to um, Article 9. This is Article 9 of the 2018 Town Meeting Minutes. What page is that on, Janice? 88. 88. Um, and I've given these corrections to um, the secretary as well. Um, it should read to elect four trustees, not three, to the Putney Public Library. Uh, the list of the, the names are correct, but two names are misspelled. It should be Francis, F-R-A-N-C-E-S, Nib. And Deirdre Kelly. Deirdre is spelled D E I R D R E Kelly, K E L L E Y. And in the last line, um, terms that will expire in March of 2021. Okay, is that? All the corrections. Yes. Are there any other corrections to the minutes? Yes. Lawrence. Thank you, uh, Lawrence O'Neill. Article uh, 14, page 89. Study is misspelled. <laughs> uh, so, do you, did you get Kim that Lawrence's name was misspelled on page 89? Uh, Janice, sorry, sorry, just to go back for a second. Janice, what is the year, the expiration of the year? Because uh, the notes that Kim received said 2020, what did it say, Kim? It says 2020. 2020, okay, great, thank you. There was just some confusion. <laughs> That's great, thank you. So now we're moving to Lawrence and we're getting his name spelled correctly. What, oh, sorry. Okay, so the corrected minutes should read 2021. Thank you, Janice. Now we're moving to Lawrence, and his name was misspelled on page... 89, Article 14, second paragraph. L-A-W, L-A-W, okay. and two L's. Any other corrections to the minutes? It looks like we are ready to approve them. All those in favor of approving the minutes for the 2018 town meeting, please indicate by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, please say nay. It appears that the ayes have it and the minutes are approved. I'm gonna adjust my mic. We are now moving to Article 7, to hear and act upon the reports of the town officers. That is for information that is in your town report. If anybody has any questions about those, we can either take time now or we can keep moving and you can get in touch with people at a later date. It looks like we are ready to move on to Article 8. 
Article 8 is going to be decided by Australian ballot, but let me read in the actual article. The town of Putney seeks voter approval to incur bonded indebtedness for the purpose of financing the joint purchase with the town of Dummerston, the 32-acre plus-minus Rinald gravel pit in the town of Dummerston for the purpose of extraction of gravel for use in constructing and maintaining their highways and other lawful purposes for a purchase price not to exceed $2 million, shared equally with each town paying $1 million toward the purchase price. The question to be voted upon by Australian ballot will be as follows. Shall general obligation bonds of notes or notes of the town of Putney in the amount not to exceed $1 million bearing interest at a rate not to exceed 4.25% for a term not to exceed 25 years be issued for the purpose of financing the 32-acre plus-minus Renault gravel pit in Demerston, Vermont, jointly with the town of Demerston, Vermont. And this will be decided by ballot. However, as I mentioned earlier, uh, st Vermont statute permits discussion. So we are now opening up the floor to any questions or comments, knowing that according to Robert's rules, uh, you may only speak once and will not be recognized for a second time unless there is nobody else who wishes to speak and that comments are limited to 10 minutes. So do we have, yes. Alan Blood, I support this. It looks to me from the handout that you're finding on your, your chairs that we're gonna save about a quarter million dollars over the next 25 years by doing this. Is that, that correct? That's, yes. That's, that's the estimate. That's the estimate, exactly. And Alan, you pointed out that in one of the columns on the sheet of paper, it appeared that there was a mistake in the total um, where it jumps from, this would be in the uh, second column from the right, in year 15, it goes from 118, 118,950 to 165,870. And in fact, that isn't a mistake. It's correct because it's when the carpenter pit runs out of sand. So we then increase the cost per yard of sand purchase. We have another hand over there, Benji. Hi, Benji Craig. Uh, I just remember when we, we went in on that other gravel pit, I remember we were gonna get 20 years of sand and gravel and we didn't quite get 20 years. So my question is, uh, the survey, ground penetrating, or just sort of how do we know, or how sure are we of the quantity of sand and gravel, and what was the method? Go ahead. Um, the, well, I'm not sure what previous gravel pit you're referring to because the 20 years, I, it, we have been purchasing gravel from the carpenter pit now for roughly a dozen years, 10-ish, 12 maybe. Um, there's another 12 to 14 years in that pit. So if that's the one you're referring to, it does in fact have that volume of sand. We're gonna keep using that because it's a good value to us, but we also believe that this is a wise investment for beyond that time. I'm not sure if that's the one you were referring to, Benji. That's fine. I just want to know what estimate. Benji, you should get the mic. The, 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 estimate, I, the, the estimates for volume of material in this, we um, contracted with Stevens & Associates, uh, who are the engineers in Brattleboro. Uh, Corey Frizee um, did estimates of volume based on surface measurements. Um, and previous information that they had from test pit digging, et cetera. So he was compiling information. They have done all the Act 250 permitting for us over or for Mike Renault over the years for this pit. So they're very familiar with the lay of the land, the volumes that are there. Um, and they were, he, he was very clear that these are estimates. Um, they, they didn't do borings because that would have, we could have done borings and figured out more accurately, but it would have cost us another 12,000 bucks up front, somewhere in that range. Um, and it was his opinion that these estimates were two things. One, they were conservative, um, and two, that they were accurate 
on the conservative side. But, but yes, they are estimates. Any other questions or comments? Yes, in the back? Jamie Putney, uh, my apologies, but uh, I have not kept up with this issue, and so I was wondering, is this the gravel pit that you observe when you drive south to Brattleboro in Dummerston? My observation of that pit over the last couple of years is that it looks increasingly dangerous. <laughs> and so I wondered what the regulatory um, procedures are for how we monitor uh, the amount of gravel that is taken from that and where and the impact it has on the residents that are on the uh, periphery. And so I just wondered if we, if we're going into a contract on this particular gravel pit, are paying attention to those kinds of concerns. Just yes, definitely. Um, it's, all, it's all permitted through Act 250, which is, it ha has all the allowances for distances to various homes, et cetera. Um, there are two separate, there, originally it was two separate pits there, which have been merged. The first one was a long time ago called the Moore Pit. And then um, it was purchased by an entity that renamed it the SB Pit. And then the second portion of it, which is the larger part of what you see, sort of those steeper walls that I think you're referring to that you see from the highway, that is the what's now called the Renault Pit, previously known as the Hidden Acres Pit. But these are have now both been combined. It's two separate Act 250 permits, but they've been combined functionally into one. The um, operation of that pit, we have not been involved in the operation of that pit. Um, it has been operated, owned and operated by Renault Brothers. Um, and it's all governed by MSHA, which is the Mining Safety and Health Administration. Um, and it's all very tightly controlled what the slopes are, how much they're allowed to take out before they need to reclaim, what they need to reseed, et cetera. Um, so it's all within the governance of MSHA ruling how that pit is worked. Um, as far as impact on neighbors is concerned, that's mostly related to Act 250 permit. Um, and there are tight controls on volumes of trucks. Both of those pits were each limited to 30,000 yards of removal each year. Um, and that would continue, that stays with the pits. Um, the other thing is that there is blasting involved because there's a lot of ledge product. And again, that's governed by both the Act 250 permits and by the Mine Safety and Health Administration, both which require vibration testing and sound volumes, et cetera, to be monitored tightly. Okay, so we, I, just because we're doing one person, and, and, and people should know that we will be able to deliberate on this, uh, elements of this uh, with Article 9. So this is now discussion and the voting will take place behind the curtains. We have a hand up front. Yes, uh, Reed Miller again. Uh, turning to page 54, I see on our long-term debt at the printing of this book, the debt stood at $3,681,223 on the principal. You add the interest rate to that, and we're in the $5 million neighborhood. So this pit for a million dollars, as if we use your figures, it would be $625,000 in financing charges. So it would cost us a million six hundred and twenty-five thousand, according to your paper. But at the meeting that we attended the other night, you said it was only $513,000 in finance charges. So this will bring our long-term debt to over six and a half million dollars. And I think that that's an awful lot of debt for a town the size of Putney. What do you say? Can we afford to spend, you said, the uh, gentleman said we were going to save a quarter of a million dollars by doing this. Well, by doing this, it's going to cost us over half a million dollars in finance charity. So where is the savings there? Well, in that spreadsheet that the gentleman was referring to, that interest payment is included in the costs involved in that. So the um, that I, I, I'm, that number that he was referring to 
is the estimated cost savings, including payment of that debt load. Um, there, I, I think there are a couple things I would like to clarify about that. One, um, it, it's my feeling, having been thoroughly involved in this investigative process for this, that if we don't purchase this pit, our expenses are likely to be significantly higher. Um, is that absolutely guaranteed? No, these are all estimates. We're doing the best we can to present what we think is a realistic budget of what this is gonna cost us. But um, if we, you know, there are a couple factors that I think about in regards to the expense of buying sand and gravel. Whether we buy this pit or not, we're gonna to continue to use the same amount of sand and gravel that we use. We have guaranteed prices through Renault for a short period of time following. We, we have been getting those and will continue to get those for a period of time. If he were to sell the pit to an outside buyer and they were to decide not to keep it as a publicly open pit, we would then be traveling to either Vernon, the two closest next largest pits that are able to provide us with this material are either in Vernon or over at Cold River in Walpole, New Hampshire. Either one of those is going to involve significant trucking, trucking and man hours for us if we're starting to buy material from that much further. So it's my opinion that there will be significant savings by doing this in that 25-year period, but almost more importantly, from my perspective, it's from that 25-year to 50-year period where we're really likely to see even more savings. But um, I, I, you know, I can only speculate as to what the price of sand and gravel is going to do over the next 25 years. So, do we have any other comments or questions? Did I did I answer your question? Sorry. Well, my main question is the money end of it. I mean. Do you know what the population of the town of Putney is? Uh, roughly 2,700, of which there are roughly 1,800 voters, so it depends, sort of depends on how you look at it. With the 2,700, it comes to over $2,400 per person. Well, it doesn't work that way because it's based on the value of your property. It's an average, you're right, that's an average, correct. I'm just talking about the long-term debt of six and a half million dollars if this gravel pit goes through. So I think we're going to need to, just in order to keep, there's another hand in the back. And I, so I apologize for taking up too much of your time. Directed it, you know, your directions the other night, some of us aren't quite up to the mental capacity to, to uh, take on all of this, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, there was a hand in the back um, on the left, and then we'll start to move towards um, what we can deliberate, which is the next article. Uh, Mark Fellows, Josh, then with the size of the stuff in that pit, is there any estimate or idea what it's going to take for equipment to work in here? Yeah, yeah. The, the vast majority of, I think, what you're referring to, Mark, would be equipment for processing the material, yeah, i.e. processing, crushers, the, blasting, so on and so yeah, forth. Yeah, right, because even if you look in there now, besides that stuff, neither town has any equipment that can move it. Well, the, the majority of the um, processing of the ledge product would be, con in, in fact, all of the processing of the ledge product, product would be contracted out, both blasting and crushing. Okay. Um, the, there are significant volumes of both bank run gravel and sand as well. And the other thing that uh, when, you, when you blast that ledge product, you also get byproduct that ends up being a smaller mix that you mix in. So we try and extend the life of the natural gravel and sand product by adding blood. But I, I think what you're getting at, Mark, is are we going to be purchasing new equipment to operate this pit? And the answer is no. Okay, so we will have to contract them. We will have, and that's all worked into the budget. We figured that we'll probably do a certain amount of crushing every year because we historically have done that. We do that in the carpenter pit because we have to. Um, it has to be screened and crushed down to the size that we can use it. 
Um, the blasting will be roughly every three to five years, depending on need, um, and we w would exercise that through, again, that's governed by Act 250, so it would be dependent on time frames for our usage. And then that. just one other short thing, whether it is fire or blasting, uh, what liabilities will the town hold throughout that? The, the, the overall liability for the pit um, is would be covered, uh, there would be a, a, a small increase, I don't know whether we know the exact number yet. We don't have that number. We don't have the exact number for the increase in liability, but um, we're insured through the Vermont League of Cities and Towns Passive Program, and we have been given estimates, which I can't remember. It, it's a relatively small number for general liability. As far as liability for blasting, et cetera, that would be the contractors who would assume that liability. Okay, it looks like we have one other hand in the back, Eva, uh, and then we're going to end discussion. I want to thank the select board and the town manager for researching this and Dumberston working, the work that you did with Dumberston to come up with this. I'm grateful, really appreciate it, and taking care of us in the future, so thank you. Okay, I, I'm not seeing, well, I do see some new hands. I'm also aware of the fact that this is not something that we're deliberating. Um, because I see two new hands up, I'm going to go to Howard and then Robin, and then I'm going to suggest that the discussion is over, and you can appeal my decision. Yes. First, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Laughlin mentioned that uh, the, uh, the Act 50 permit allows drawing up to 30,000 yards a year. Dumberston and Putney are projected to draw 18,000 a year. So it will, it will be well within the Act 250 permit. Uh, I just wanted to mention that uh, working with uh, uh, our town manager on this handout, I got to know her better. We have, an ex oh, we have a town manager who is an excellent administrator. Great, thank, thank you. you, Howard. Hi. Uh, just one other point. I didn't see it in the figures, but uh, one thing that should be reckoned uh, as to the value of purchasing this is the residual value of the land. Uh, it would still be worth something when uh, we had taken all the, the sand and gravel on it. I had a very informal uh, guesstimate from Brian Harlow, our uh, road commissioner, um, saying that uh, the value of the land, even when the towns were done with it would be probably higher than our purchase price and the operating cost. So that's something that could be factored in as well. Thank you. Okay. So we're now going to move on to Article 9. Uh, she spoke before. So we're moving on to Article 9. In the event that Article 8 passes, Shall the voters authorize the select board to enter into an interlocal agreement with the town of Dummerston to own and operate the 32 plus minus acre gravel pit in the town of Dummerston, currently known as Renau Gravel Pit, for the purpose of extraction of gravel for the town's use in constructing and maintaining their highways and other lawful purposes? Are there any questions? about Article 9, and this is, a, this is the article we are going to be deliberating, so there'll be much more opportunity for pros, cons, questions, and then we'll move to a vote. I'd, yes. like, to, I'd like to move the article. Okay, so Article 9 has been moved. Do we have a second? Alan Blood. We are now open to deliberation. Yes, um, can we get a mic to Tom? Quick question. The, um, this is due to, when, when would we assume ownership, actual ownership, if this all passes? We, it, it's based on um, the cycle of the verb of the municipal bond bank. We uh, would anticipate if this gets approved and the interlocal agreement gets approved, et cetera, we would probably receive funding in August of this year and take ownership sort of as as readily as possible at that time. And, and uh, is there some 
wants to st stop Brudeau from getting as much out of there as he can before we assume ownership. <laughs> That's the direct way of asking. There, there's nothing to stop him from doing that beyond the limit of the 60,000 yards total that he could take, of which 30,000 is in the Renault portion and 30,000 is in the SB portion. In the SB portion, there's only ledge product left. Um, so for him to take 30,000 out of there would take a significant effort in blasting and processing. Um, he's been he's been clear that he, uh, I mean, we, there was, there's discussion of this and we have a purchases and sales agreement, but he's entitled to take the proper, the, the volume of material that he is allowed to if he chooses. He has verbally said that he doesn't intend to take any more than sort of normal business, but we but we can't we don't have a legal recourse for that other than adhering to the Act 250 permit. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Yes? Right in the front? Read right 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 there. Uh, do you have a, a cost per yard on the blasted and crushed ledge? Because that's going to be over and above the million and a half that we're going in to buy it. You said it's all going to be contracted out. It's a, it, it works out to roughly $12 a yard for blasted and crushed. How many yards are you going to use for that a year? Uh, roughly 1500 per town. So, roughly so you want to add that on to what we're going to be paying for over the million and a half we're it's already in, it's already included in the highway budget um, as the highway budget is presented because we would purchase that material if we didn't purchase it there we just got an estimate yesterday from Sir Sosimo down in Vernon for that for a similar product and it they sell it for seventeen dollars a yard currently so um, well, I'm just trying to get to the bottom line on how much it's really going to cost it's gone from a million to a million and a half and then it's a million and a half. No, it hasn't, it hasn't, it hasn't, cha it hasn't changed at so all. Actually, just for a second, so yeah. Reed, thank you, but uh, there's another hand up for questions, and we, we'll be able to um, uh, take on more deliberation later. So right, we have Lionel, and then Kathleen. Thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to ask about the shared ownership uh, with Dummerston. Um, has there been a lot of discussion as far as how this would work? Uh, is there going to be a line drawn in the sand uh, between <laughs> towns in terms of who, who's going to own which half? Uh, and in the event of a divorce, uh, what would happen? Um, th there, there, there won't be a um, line carved in the ledge, but there will be um, an agreement, well, a couple things, a little bit of history on this. We've had a very long-standing working relationship with Dummerston going back many decades. Um, the, the most current is both the use of this same pit, which we both were involved in the initiation of through supporting Act 250 permitting for Mike with a municipal agreement with him. But um, also the carpenter pit, which I referred to, we currently share responsibility for management of that with Dummerston and have done so for roughly a dozen years, and it has worked very well. Even previous to that, we used to own gravel processing material together. We owned a screening and crushing unit that we sold in 2005, 2006, something like that. Basically because the expense of the equipment, that, that piece of equipment was outdated. The expense of owning and operating this type of equipment is not a reasonable thing for us to undertake. Um, the municipal agreement that we're talking about now, and I might just, if it's all right with the moderator, with Madam Moderator, I will just read the purpose there's a, a single statement of purpose for this interlocal agreement, which sort of lays out sure. what we're thinking. Is that right? yep. Much of that would govern what you're talking about at a sort of meta level, and then the details are more sort of the day-to-day -day negotiation. But the purpose of this agreement sets forth the terms and conditions under which Dummerston and Putney shall own, operate, and develop the jointly owned premises for extraction of gravel for use in constructing and maintaining their highways and other lawful purposes. 
The terms and conditions of this agreement are not exclusive and are not intended to limit the authority of Dummerston and Putney acting by and through their respective select boards to alter, amend, or adopt additional or different terms or conditions deemed to be in the best interest of the municipalities consistent with the intent of the agreement. So this is just sort of a global agreement of how we would interact with each other. Um, as far as the day-to-day -day operation, again, long-term commitment to working together on these types of things and very well-demonstrated ability to do that. Um, you know, they're, both towns would track how much material they take, um, you know, not down to the grain of sand, but within reason, sort of per truckload kind of thing. Um, and there would be a reckoning periodically. We figure roughly every three years we would reconcile that as necessary. Um, the, the main reason we discussed that is because, for example, if one of the towns were to have a, an Irene-like event, um, and need a large volume of material to fix that problem, we would have to reconcile that over time. Neither town, in the agreement, um, my, my understanding is that neither town would assume financial responsibility for that up front, but that we would even it out over time as the two towns went forward, so that it wouldn't put an undue financial burden on one, one of the towns. We have a question up front with Kathleen, or? A uh, comment, uh, question. Um, why is it that we're purchasing this? Why did it come for sale? And did we initiate it? Did Dumberstand or did uh, Renault come and say, I'm selling this? Um, mm -hmm. Renault Brothers uh, approached the, the, the towns um, and said, I'm thinking about selling this and I'm wondering whether you are interested. Um, the, the, the reason that it would be, um, the purpose of purchasing it would be to protect that as a resource in the long term. Um, you know, we have guarantee for another roughly six years with Renault to purchase gravel from it as it is. If it changes hand, that hands, that agreement still can be enforced to a certain extent, but the condition, the terms of it change. Um, if it were to, if, if he were to, or they were to put it on the open market, um, somebody might purchase it that was not going to keep operating it as an open pit. For example, you know, just as an example, Lane Construction, who does high, huge highway projects, they might well decide to purchase it and keep it all in-house because to protect it for their purposes. So we would have no guarantee if it went to open market that we would have access to any of the material coming out of that pit. If that were the case, as I mentioned before, we would be going either to Vernon or to Walpole to purchase material, which is an expensive endeavor for us. So geographically speaking, this is in our best interest? Mm -hmm. we, we believe so. Yeah, I believe so. Is there anybody from the floor who wishes to speak on behalf, or if you want to ask a question or what, or whatever? But I'm starting to move Article Nine forward. Yes, in the back. So um, I appreciated Josh what you just said about uh, Dumberston and um, Putney owning it, and just imagining us having the decision making over it versus someone else who might not have. Um, Demerson and Putney's interests at heart. The piece that I wanted to follow up on earlier was, are we able to track whether or not there have been complaints, environmental complaints by the neighbors, particularly related to water quality? And if there have been, how do we be prepared to work with neighbors around that? Um, and then I just wanted to commend Demerson and Putney for not having to dissolve their select boards in order to work collaboratively together on a joint project. Because I think you guys have demonstrated uh, a great capacity to do that. Thank you, and I, 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 I won't try and read into the innuendo of the end of that comment, but I don't find it helpful, thank you. Um, but um, the water quality has not been a problem in that pit. It's monitored regularly, um, and the, the the basis of permitting 
for gravel pits is based largely on proximity to water table and risk to that water table. It's very closely monitored by MSHA, the groups that, that uh, you know, it's essentially, as long as we're operating the pit appropriately, it's the opinion of MSHA that that's not a particular risk for us. There's always inherent risks in something like that, but um, we, we don't anticipate that being a, specific, a problem specific to this pit. It has not historically been a problem for this pit. Is there somebody who wishes to speak? Sorry, Doug. D uh, Doug has had his hand up first. Yeah. Did you want to finish your? Well, I was going to say in favor, but. Well, I, I guess I'm in, in favor, but I'll be I came out of an industry where properties that generated revenues and profits were traded, sold, and bought. And the price of those properties was based on the present value cash flows of the future. Um, it occurred to me after a meeting the other night that a million dollars or two million dollars is a pretty round number. I'm wondering if that was just pulled out of the air, if that was somehow calculated or negotiated, what would the price be if we took their future profits and discounted them at some discount rate to today would it be much lower or much higher than two million dollars can somebody answer that i'm not sure i can accurately answer the whole question um as to where the number came from mike renault came up with it and said this is what i'm willing to sell it for to the two towns um he he do you have a follow-up it came from mike renault yeah so in, in here we're voting on allowing a price not to exceed $2 million? Or Correct. Not? So does that mean there will be still some negotiation? No, the price is too much. A purchase and sales agreement has been signed at the price of $2 million. So not to exceed is irrelevant, okay. Um, and just to remind people that we are, uh, I know Article 8 and Article 9 are both about the gravel pit. Article 9, what we are deliberating now, has to do with authorizing the select board to enter into an interlocal agreement. Lawrence had his hand up. I'm speaking in favor of this, I believe, because something you alluded to, Josh, was the, the cost of trucking material from either Walpole or Guilford. We all know where fuel costs are going, we all know where equipment costs are going, and we're supposed to be so very green here. We're gonna be putting all kinds of stuff in the air to truck that material. It's not light material, it creates a lot of pollution to move it around. So I think that's a fact. I don't know if you've done any study on what the, those increased costs would be, but that's something that should be looked at, in, including the cost to our environment for trucking that material, for moving it around. We didn't cost everything out exactly. It was estimated that to move the volume of material that we would need to move from one of those pits would be about a half a man year in trucking time, i.e. one of our highway department people would be driving full time just moving material. So it would be a half a year salary plus the wear and tear on the vehicle plus the fuel expense. Um, we didn't cost that out exactly um, and extrapolate into the future, but that is a cost that would be incurred as a result of that. So we just heard somebody speaking in favor. Is there somebody who wants to speak against Article 9? We have a hand in the back, Tom. I'm not speaking against, just a quick query. At this point, does Dummerston and Putney, do we use, in terms of the interlocal agreement, do we use about the same amount very close, Very yes, close. yeah. I, I mean, as far as we can figure, I, identical. I mean, we do, as I said, we do much of our processing together. So when we do that processing, it tends to be in equal volumes. Um, in any given year, hard to predict, but, um, but I would say my best guess, Tom, would be within 5% probably at worst case scenario. Do we have a hand, Janice, in the back? Janice Baldwin, um, really quick question. Has Dunson already approved this? And if not, what happens if they don't? It, and we do. Then, then we don't have an agreement. The, the purchases and sales agreement is based on both towns approving it. So if either town votes it down, there is no, that purchase and sale agreement is void. Um, you know, would we then re-explore doing it at a future date? 
I'm not sure. We'd have to see what the work involved would be. We have uh, in the back, Mary. We get a mic on the right to the back. Hi, Mary Quinn. This is just a comment or actually a question. We're talking about if this doesn't go through, we would, and when everything ran out in the carpenter pit, we'd have to go to Vernon and Walpole. But how do we know that they'll still be available? It's a good question. Um, in fact, uh, yesterday when Karen was inquiring about the cost of ledge product, um, the operator of the pit, the, the pit in Vernon is owned by Sir Sosimo Industries. Um, the pit in Wal uh, Walpole, I believe, is owned by some offshoot of Lane Construction. Um, but they have made it clear, or at least Sir Sosimo has, that there would be no guarantee that any of this material would be available roughly 20 years from now. They, m many of the pits that are currently operating are looking at essentially a 20-year horizon for exhaustion. And in fact, this pit, if you were to operate it at maximum capacity, i.e. that 60,000 yards a year that I talked about, you know, if this is an accurate number of 900,000, it's going to be exhausted in 15 years of all product. The product, both the sand and the gravel product, are likely to be exhausted within five to seven years, somewhere in that range. So we, we have no guarantee that they'd be avail available from there or, or anywhere within our local proximity, for that matter. We have a hand in the back, Mike, Mike Merwicki. Hi, Mike Merwicki. Just as a point of information, uh, I was over at Dummerston Town Meeting earlier and they were discussing this, and there seemed to be overwhelming support for it. Of course, they have to uh, vote uh, by Australian ballot, too, but they seem really in line with, with this agreement moving forward with it. So, so far, we've heard lots of questions and some support. It, uh, are we starting to move towards a vote? Yeah. I'm getting a lot of nodding. Uh, so, we are voting on Article 9, I'm going to read it again. In the event that Article 8 passes, shall the voters authorize the select board to enter into an interlocal agreement with the town of Dummerston to own and operate the 32 plus minus acre gravel pit in the town of Dummerston, currently known as Renault Gravel Pit, for the purpose of extraction of gravel for the town's use in constructing and maintaining their highways and other lawful purposes. All those in favor of Article 9, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, please indicate by saying nay. Nay. It appears that the ayes have it. The ayes have it, and Article 9 passes. We will now move on to Article 10. I'm going to read it in first, and then I'll get a motion to see if the town will vote to exempt Yellow Barn Music School from municipal and educational taxation on the improvements and appurtenances, music studios, on land owned by the Greenwood School, lot 070248-ON, 15 Greenwood Lane for a period of five years, beginning April 1st, 2019, as authorized by 32 VSA section 3832-7. Do I have a motion? We have a motion? John Hendricks. Do we have a second? Um, Nancy Sturrow. Uh, it has been moved and second for Article 10. We are now discussing Article 10. Do you have any questions? And, and maybe, uh, this, Kathleen, you are a Putney, Catherine, sorry, you are a Putney resident. Uh, would you like to speak on behalf of Article 10? Yes. Okay. Catherine Steffen, proud puppy resident and also executive director of Yellow Barn. I'll be as brief as possible. I know we've all been here for a long time. Thank you for, for your patience. Just wanted to give a little bit of background. I know we might have some new residents uh, in town and also a little bit of a refresher for some people who've been here for some time. First of all, this is an existing exemption. It's in place because Yellow Barn found itself homeless in 2008 and some wonderful leaders in the community made it possible for us to return here by way of building some music studios at the Greenwood School. And a part of that was the town allowing us to have those, those uh, the land that those studios are on uh, tax-free. 
I believe I spoke with our enlister recently. I believe we're talking about an amount. Sorry, how are we back on? We are uh, talking about an amount of about $900. However, that uh, did matter back then. It still does now. And it did make us possible to move home here, where we will be celebrating our 50th anniversary this coming summer. Uh, for those of you who have been here, you know that David and Janet Wells remain dear to our hearts. And you can actually see David Wells on a mural outside that wall over there, along with other pillars of Putney history. In terms of what Yellow Barn, uh, I should say what Putney means to Yellow Barn today, there are a couple of things that you should keep in mind, or I'd like you to keep in mind. Uh, one is very simply the economic, um, the economic realities. Yellow Barn contributes greatly to Putney, not only in tourism dollars, as many of you have seen, we have many concerts over the course of the summer. Our parking lot is often full of people who are coming from near and far, a lot of people from the greater region who otherwise might not be coming to our downtown. Uh, so there are those tourism dollars. They're eating at the Gleanery, they're eating at JV's, they're shopping at the co-op, uh, and all the other good things that tourists do while they're here. They're also renting housing from Putney residents to attend concerts over numerous days. Something that Yellow Barn also does during the summer to house our faculty. We rent a lot of housing from the Putney community. We also buy our supplies through the general store whenever we can. We employ local contractors. In short, we give as much as possible of our business through the town of Putney as we can. We also donate services as much as possible. Uh, we present performances here free of charge to the Putney Central School community. We also have curriculum-based programming that we've uh, collaborated with HERV on over the years. We also have been uh, at other schools in the area. Uh, if anybody has any questions specifically about what Yellow Barn has done, oh, I also was reminded that before my tenure, um, Yellow Barn actually gave a couple of fundraising performances for the general store. Uh, that's another thing that's part of our history. Uh, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer them, but I just thought that it would be helpful to give a little bit of that background. Yes? Are you currently uh, Lawrence O'Neill, are you currently a 501 3C charity? Yes, we are. We have been since 1972. Yes. Uh, and actually, Catherine, if you don't mind, the questions are going to come to me. Sure. Some of the questions may actually <laughs> need to be answered by select members. And if it is a specific one, then we would love to find out sure, the information sure. from you. So we'll hold back. If you could give the mic. Yeah. Sure. yeah. yeah. Thank you, and thank you, Catherine. Um, has the value changed on any of those properties? As I recall, they were sort of studio pods. Um, has the value changed since the reappraisal? Does somebody from the town wish to answer that? Jordy or, Heller. Jordy Heller, thank you. The value on the pods is $40,000, and that has not changed since reappraisal. Are there any other questions right there? Uh, what Jordy didn't say, which I am aware of, is that the... Could you restate your name? I'm sorry, Jim Oliver. Yeah. Is that the, uh, the, the tax proceeds, if it were not tax exempt, correct me if I'm not saying this correctly, would be about $900 a year. Do we have any other questions? Does anybody, we've heard somebody speaking in favor of Article 10. Does anybody wish to speak against Article 10? It appears that we may be moving to a vote on Article 10. Uh, yes, right here. Yes, uh, reading the letter again. <laughs> Sorry to disturb it. Uh, I don't think anybody in the room is opposed to yellow burn. You're a long-established institution in this town. Mm -hmm. But uh, I know we discussed tax exempt properties at the meeting last week. He referred me to the town clerk's office who didn't have a clue as to what I was talking about. And I went to, and spoke to a lister. And I still haven't got a number. I'm just simply looking for a number of the total tax exempt properties in the town of Putney, the total dollar number. I'm not head hunting for anybody. I just want the, the total number. Perhaps somebody from the committee that worked on this 
two years ago would have that answer because the town clerk and the listings don't seem to. So I'm, I'm just looking for a yeah. Jordy, number. Jordy, can you, Mr. Miller's question was what the total value of all the exempt properties in Putney is. Jordy and I had a conversation about this the other day um, and we looked at it at, as a result of can, your can question. Let's give the mic so, to Jordy. Do Jordy, you have something yeah. specific? We, we don't have a number. There are some properties that are statutorily tax exempt and they don't show up in the grant list. Uh, that's a number we could dig out, but it's not one that we have ready at our fingertips. Because what, uh, what I'm hearing is perhaps for the next town report, would we be able to generate such, a, such information? It, it's there, we can get it. Yeah, it's so just, to put it, it out for the town report, but, Something to consider. Right. It's definitely, I'm not s saying that this is what needs to happen, but it seems like that's something for the select board to consider going forward. Um, I was getting a, a strong sense that we may be ready to move to, to start to vote on Article 10, but I, Eva, did you want to jump in? I, Go ahead. Can, I just want to point out that there, um, the exempted properties. Uh, are on page 56 various different voted exemptions um, state law considers current use an exemption um, we get reimbursed by the state for that so it doesn't take from our tax income but the total value of all of those including veterans exemptions which is our um, fourth rate uh, and grandfathered voted exemptions etc is 17 million two hundred and seventy two thousand one hundred and seventy five however 15 million of that is um, the current use number which again you know depends on how you interpret it because we get reimbursed for the state whether that's technically exempt or not um, the other the other larger component that I think Mr. Miller is referring to is the educational institutions in town. The two of which have the largest value, of course, are Putney School and Landmark College. Many of their exemptions are statutory and so we have no governance over them. Um, well, well, Jordy will work on that number and we'll have an accurate mm -hmm. answer for you. Obviously not right now. Um, you know, uh, the two schools are worth a very significant amount, but it doesn't represent an exemption, an exemption in the way, it doesn't take from our tax rolls per se, because we are ineligible to tax them. So, so I'm just going to remind us that we're discussing Article 10 to see if the town will vote to accept Yellow Barn Music School. Uh, there's Nancy. Oh, sorry, Eva. Nancy Olson. The, um, I was a member of the tax exempt committee that worked on this question two years ago, and uh, our report is on the town website under documents, I think. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. And Eva, did you want to say something? Well, just when we talk about tax exempt, for God's sake, I mean, Yellow Barn did a, a fundraiser for the roof of the town hall. All these schools raised the money, so we have the fire department. Why do we do this? I mean, we they employ so many people in this community, and per, I mean, let us stop the convincing about the well, nonprofits. Um, so anyway, we're going to move towards Article Ten. Um, what other question or concern? In the back, woman standing. And this is a nephew. I just wondered if you could tell me, someone could tell me how much Yellow Barn gets from other exemptions, like all of the tax exemptions they get, because I don't think this is the only place that they get an exemption for. Does anyone know? Does anyone know the answer to that question? Oh, uh, Catherine has an answer, and then we'll. Go to Catherine. Right here up front. This is our only exemption. Thank you. 
All right. So we are moving on Article 9. I'm beginning to think we may be able to move to a vote. Um, all right. So we are now voting on Article 9. I'm sorry, 10. Article 10. To see if the town will vote to exempt Yellow Barn Music School from municipal and educational taxation on the improvements and appurtenances music studios on land owned by the Greenwood School, lot 07024809, 15 Greenwood Lane for a period of five years beginning April 1st, 2019 as authorized by 32 VSA, section 3832.7. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, please indicate by saying nay. It appears that the ayes have it. The ayes have it, and Article 10 passes. We are now moving to Article 11. To see if the town will vote to authorize the select board to borrow an amount not to exceed $175,000 to purchase a dump truck for the highway department to be repaid over a period of not more than five years. Do we have a motion? Do we have a second? Second. Norm Bartlett. Oh, Lord. Okay. Um, it has been moved and second. Does anybody have any questions about Article 11? Yes. like a bad penny here. That's, okay. uh, That's how it works here. It's good. We want one hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars for another truck, and on page fifty-two of the equipment list, I see that we already have six dump trucks. How much mileage do we have, and how many town employees? Is everybody driving a dump truck. Is well, there somebody who can answer? That? Part of this would be yeah. I, I, I'm going to have Brian address that but part of this would be that one of these trucks would be retired in the process um so i'm quite familiar with the highway department years ago and <laughs> three was usually the limit on trucks that we had and we now have six so that's double do we need a seventh we wouldn't have a seventh we would get rid of one of these well and, all of these are relatively have. recent so, so we need, need, if you could just let him one hundred seventy-five thousand dollars for a new one Reed, I'm sorry to cut you off. It's just if, if you could let whoever's answering your questions answer before, and then I'll see if, if there's nobody else waiting for a second question. I believe Lawrence had, no? You're good. Okay, any other questions about Article 11? Can we get Brian to answer the question? I, I think that the, the one that would be being retired, Brian, would be dump truck number two, which was purchased in uh 2004 it's a 14 year old truck you may recall that a couple years ago we agreed instead of purchasing a new truck at that time we decided to put a significant amount of money into rehabilitating this truck which at that time was roughly 10 years old um we've now gotten four more years out of it we generally try and retire our trucks at about 10 years because we experience has shown that after 10 years, the economics of it, the, it's just diminishing returns. We end up putting more money into it than it's worth for us. Um, and I think as to the question of whether we need six trucks, uh, we certainly use all our trucks very regularly. So whenever there's a storm and the expectation is that people are plowed out in X period of time, that, that um, those are the trucks that we use. So, uh, did you want, Ryan, did you wish to speak on this or? No, okay. Do we have any other questions or does somebody want to speak in favor? Uh, no? uh, Benji Cragen, I am, uh, well, we had six, will six dump trucks be running at the same time? We have five full size and one small. And we have six, and we've got six road crew people will run them at the same time. I'm not sure people could hear his answers. Can you relay his answers? Yeah. He said, yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, it, it, it raises an important point, actually, that Mr. Miller was at a meeting the other night, um, and we were discussing whether it's really necessary to have the budget 
be the way it is for the highway department and these expenditures. And um, we arrived at the fact that basically there were two options. Either we keep spending money to do, to improve the services that we provide, or we stop spending money. I mean, this is like for the gravel pit. We can either purchase it with the hope of saving money over time, or we don't purchase it and we keep going as we are. After that meeting, Brian pointed out to me, and I think he's right, and this is something I think we all need to really consider in these discussions, is there's a third option, and that, as Mr. Reed inferred in his statement, we could have less services. Um, if people didn't need to get out of their houses by nine o'clock every morning in a snowstorm, we wouldn't need to provide the service that we do. But the fact is we've all arrived at a point in time where we expect that service to be what it is, so we pay a premium for it. And I would neither argue in favor or against that, I'm just pointing out that we could choose to cut the highway budget in half and have half the services that we have. But we would all have to accept that that's what we were going to do. So that's, that's where we are. We have evolved to the point where this is the service that we've all come to anticipate. And I know personally, I get phone calls at 9 o'clock in the morning when somebody's road is in plow. Well, we all live in Vermont. Um, you know, we could, we could decide to go backwards on that. What's that? So I, I didn't actually, yeah. you can't, uh, I need to sorry, recognize sorry. Yeah. if somebody yeah. wishes to say something. Yeah. Sorry. I, was, I was being facetious, you know, people that I found in my experience in the highway department are people who expect city services from rural towns. And, and, and I'm, I'm agreeing with you. And I mean, you say, I, I pay taxes, why isn't my road plowed first? I, we used to, the phone used to ring off the wall, and mostly it wasn't your, your long term native Vermont people because they accept the fact that it's winter. If you're going to be a few minutes late because of a snowstorm, so be it. The boss doesn't understand it, it works for him too. So, but, I, it, but I just, I wouldn't, I wouldn't hold that up as an excuse to have. I'm going, to so on I'm, going to, I'm going to take what you're saying as reasonable concerns and that that is a uh, argument against Article 11. Am I... I just think $175,000 mm -hmm. is a great deal of money for a truck. And I notice it's Western Star. I mean, if you're going to buy a truck, let's buy the Cadillac of trucks. Let's not go back to the, to the middle of the road truck. Western Star has been known for for extreme excellence over the years, but does it apply to a truck for town work? I know your uh, tractor trailer trucks I've driven for 30 plus years and, and the Western Stars are very highly thought of in prestige, but I don't need prestige, I need to save some money on my tax bill. Great, so now is there somebody who wishes to speak against, I mean sorry, in favor of Article 11? Uh, well, and I, I am in favor of um, plowing our roads and, and sending them. Um, this is Eileen Chu. Hello. <laughs> um, I just, I was asking, I was, uh, it occurred to me uh, procedurally um, back across the river where we used to live, um, they would set up uh, capital funds, re revolving funds, and then we would put money into that fund over a period of, say, five years. And so, the money was actually less money per year to for to purchase these larger um, items, which we have to keep buying periodically. Um, and I don't know if that's something that um, Putney is is allowed to do. I don't know if that's a Vermont a, a side of the river kind of thing, but um, I didn't know if that was something that we could consider in the future. Can somebody answer Eileen's question? Yeah, we. we in some ways, this acts as our revolving fund because it's because it's borrowing, um, and I know that that means we pay interest on it. Um, you know, the interest rates that we get are favorable for municipalities. We tend to get very good rates. Um, we have discussed that numerous times in various different, and we and we do it for different components of different areas of our budget. We don't do it with our capital with our equipment capital budget um, it's just a different model um, and I, 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 I it's been a topic of discussion a number of times I'm not sure 
there's a compelling argument necessarily to do one or the other. For the time being, this is how we do it, but, um, but we have explored it periodically. So I'm going to take that as a question. Is there somebody who wishes to speak in favor of Article 11? Uh, Lionel? Yeah, I'm, I'm very much am in favor of this. Uh, road, uh, highway departments are um, very skilled and knowledgeable, and it's their business to try to do the best job they can. And I have no expertise in that department. I absolutely rely on the expertise of the road crew and, and its director to know how to proceed. So I don't think we should be second guessing our staff. Uh, I think we should support them and move the article. Uh, is there somebody who wishes to speak against who has not spoken before? So does anybody wish to speak against who has not spoken before? Uh, Doug is, has not spoken before on this discussion. Well, I have a, Doug Grant, I have a question which may lead to a, an amendment. <laughs> So the question is, what make and model is this, and what kind of engine does it have? What kind of fuel does it burn? Um, the, the make and model have not been determined yet. I think Brian has put some significant thought in that. Um, we've had pretty good luck with the Westerns. Historically, we ran almost exclusively Max. Um, we have now been running a Western Star for a number of years and have had good luck with it. One of the big advantages to us of that is that they are sold at Patriot Motors, which is just up the road um, as far as downtime and maintenance. So I guess my main question is what kind of fuel does it It would be a diesel. So, um, you know, with the climate situation the way it is, I'm pondering at what point, at what point do we start to move away from diesel fossil fuels? And how could that be done? It's kind of a conundrum because we got a bunch of diesel trucks, and you buy diesel, and and to have a compressed natural gas or an electric. So I'm pondering making an amendment to ask you to consider or to do some exploration with some of the truck manufacturers whether they're considering electric. You know, a lot of electric are coming out now. I mean, Federal Express, UPS. Uh, um, so Doug, do you, the rest Doug yeah. do you, because you just use amendment language, do you have specific language that you wish to introduce into Article 11? Yeah, I'd like to amend that um, the town staff investigate electric powered vehicles, period. And, and would that come at the end of Article 11? So it would then read, to see if the town will vote to authorize the select board to borrow an amount not to exceed 175000 to purchase a dump truck for the highway department to be re repaid over a period of not more than five years. Oh, I see your point. You see, I'm, I'm just trying to figure um, out where to stick it in. And to, and, and to investigate plausible electric vehicles if and if they are less expensive to purchase one of those or to that um, I doubt that the answer is going to be yes, but uh, I'd, I'd like to have, have it explored. Just uh, and to, would it be enough to do? And, and you can correct me. And to investigate plausible electric vehicles, that means yeah. that you're giving a request to. Period. Okay. Period. So we have a, a motion to amend. Do we have a second? Yes. Yes. So. Uh, Lord Campbell. So we have motioned and seconded an amendment. We are now discussing the amendment, which is, I'm going to read it out one more time, to see if the town will vote to authorize the select board to borrow an amount not to exceed 175000 to purchase a dump truck for the highway department, to be repaid over a period of not more than five years, and to investigate plausible electric vehicles. Would somebody like to speak in favor of the amendment? Hydrogen is another option, maybe electric or hydrogen. Uh, do we have a friendly amendment? Does the second go along with that? Yes. Okay, so Laura Campbell said yes. I'm treating that as a friendly amendment. So it's now electric or hydrogen. Or hydrogen. Would somebody like to speak in favor? Question. Question. Susan Kuczynskis, my question is whether this is a mandate 
or it's just asking them to research it. Just asking to research. If it turns out it's cheaper, do it. If not, can we get the mic? So, and to investigate, you are saying that means do you want to? Can you use a mic to answer that? Whether it's mandated or it's not a mandate. It's a question to find out what is plausible. And if it is plausible, then to act on that and purchase, I doubt it's going to be possible. I think we need to start the conversation. Um, Nancy, can you get that mic Nancy? Nancy Olson, would that be better under Article 15 to transact any other town business that may come legally before the town? I think that's a reasonable question. I don't know. At the moment, we have it as an amendment to this article. So that's the way we're going to need to deliberate. You can strike down it and then bring it up under Article 15. But that's, I think, the procedure we'll need to take. We have another hand up. If I'm missing you, please wiggle, because sometimes I, my sight line's Howard. Uh, two questions to clarify. First one, probably to Mr. M to, to Mr. Lachlan. Uh, I understand that this is a full-sized dump truck? Correct. Okay. Then my question to the gentleman who moved the amendment is, uh, because he appears to have some expertise on these matters, do electric-powered or hydrogen-powered full-sized dump trucks actually exist at this time? I don't know the answer to that, but I know that Tesla is making a big rig and um, many large heavy equipment, heavy duty uh, trucks are being uh, introduced at this time. It's just the beginning, so I presume they could do it if we wanted them to, and may come at a very big price, but I think we need to find out. Does anyone wish to speak against the amendment? We have something in the back, somebody in the back. Hi, uh, Richard Dubs. Um, I would just like to point out that uh, current battery technology is not anywhere near as efficient or as advanced as it should be. Um, while electric vehicles do save uh, carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere, their shelf life while in the vehicle is very limited and they just end up in a dump or in another facility where they leach into the ground. And overall, um, they do save the atmosphere, but they push in the ground. Um, I would suggest waiting another 15, 20 years for efficient battery technology to actually exist. Is there somebody who wants to speak for the amendment who has not spoken? This looks like we have a hand up front. Hi, uh, Emily Payton in Pontiac. Just to that point, there are companies that are doing amazing things. I just want to mention one called Carbon Engineering which has uh, found a way to take carbon out of the atmosphere and combine it with a hydrogen to make a clean carbon negative fuel. And I just thought that would be of interest. And that way, yes, we should uh, do this. Is there somebody who wishes to speak against the amendment? Uh, in the back. Uh, although Howard has spoken on this, is there anybody else who wishes? Oh, no, I guess Howard was a question. Try to keep track. This is a feel-good amendment because uh, we're not going to be able to go to any truck dealer. I'm assuming we would like to have the truck fairly soon and say, have you got an electric-powered or hydrogen-powered truck for us? And because it is a feel-good amendment, it is actually a pie-in-the-sky amendment, and I shall vote now. Great. Do we have somebody who wishes to speak in favor? We have a hand in the back. And you're sitting on the other side of the chains. Are you? I yeah. I thought so. I have a okay. I'll yeah, if you could just identify. Hello, my name is Mich my name is Michaela Marmion. Um, I don't know if this makes it more complicated. I really appreciate you bringing this up. I, I wonder because we're like, well, electric technology and hydrogen technology, and, and I'm just wondering, do we want to say something? <laughs> this would be a friendly amendment about. Um, about like t you know take into account climate consequences on what we're you know do we do we need to make the language more 
if, if we're concerned about what is it is act are we locked in with with electric so I don't Kayla, know can you do offer that. any language well who said we are now yeah to our amendment yeah something like something like um you know something like uh, we'll consider we'll consider climate realities in our search and research also electric hydrogen and other carbon neutral or something like that um, options for our transportation department and I wish that um, we may start to run into problems because it sounds like you are also wanted to strike some of the earlier amendment that uh, you are putting nope. in and, and will consider climate realities. Yeah, please. Somebody wants to make a friendly amendment to my amendment, and I, I'm good with that. Is that okay with you? Okay, friendly amendments are a little bit dicey, just okay. because we want to make sure that we don't get too far. Right. Another option is okay. if this gets voted down, okay. for then us to reconsider. Okay. Because uh, otherwise, I am going to actually need very specific language from you, and okay. I'm going to treat it as an amendment to um, okay to Doug's amendment, and it can get awfully confusing for the voters. I know I start yeah. to get confused. Yeah. So that's great. So yeah. I'm going to suggest that and not ask for a second on you. Do you hear what I'm doing, though? I do hear what you're doing. OK, so I'm, I'm not, if it's OK, I'm not going to look, or I'll, I'm going to suggest we don't do a second on yours and s go back to it and then see if we need to further okay. change once we can. Can I, the can I propose a specific language? Thing uh, do you, is it that you want to propose a, a different amendment to Doug's amendment? It would just be change. It would just be changing a word, probably. Okay. If it's it just a word, just be changing hydrogen to energy efficient, or so, you know. So the amendment you're making is and to investigate plausible Hi or electric hydrogen and energy efficient options. Or energy to just give us more space. Energy efficient options. Doug, I'm going to treat it as a friendly amendment because it seems like it's close enough. Thank you. I would change energy efficient to carbon free. Yeah. All right. Are, are people okay with this? We are now moving, and we're doing it this a little bit fast and furious. <laughs> so now Doug's amendment, which has. Uh, were you the second? Laura Campbell? So now I'm, I'm wondering, can we move this forward and to investigate plausible electric or hydrogen or carbon-free vehicles? I cannot second that. Okay. So I'm not, I'm going to stay with our amendment as it was and I'm not going to take that as a friendly amendment because the second didn't go with it. We are back to deliberating the amendment as Doug um, originally said, no, I'm sorry, not originally, and to investigate plausible electrical or hydrogen vehicles, period. Yes. Um, I, I do think we are getting into Article 15 territory here. Um, I think we should possibly go uh, we could vote on the article as amended the way it is, but if there's there's a lot more to this issue than what we're talking about, and I think that that would be an excellent time to come up with some kind of resolution to further investigate the issue. Um, so, can we start to move to vote on this amendment? We're just all we're going to do is vote on the amendment. Just to remind everybody, the amendment is to add to Article 11 and to investigate plausible electric or hydrogen vehicles. All those in favor of the amendment, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, please indicate by saying nay. Nay. It appears that the nays have it. The nays have it, and the amendment does not pass. We are now going back to Article 11, which is without its amendments. Is there anybody who wishes to speak in favor of Article 11? In the back. Robin. Robin, next to uh, Just wanted to remind people that the front page of the Reformer uh, within the last week had an article about uh, 
uh, fire truck in Rockingham that was retired unexpectedly after 20 years uh, due to a split in the frame uh, caused by rust. Uh, dump trucks see much harder service than fire trucks, I, I would believe. Uh, dump trucks are not stored indoors. Uh, they're out in all kinds of weather. The uh, torque and force that uh, a truck like that goes through in plowing roads with a side plow is pretty significant. I don't think it's unreasonable to expect that we have to uh, replace these vehicles on, unfortunately, a fairly frequent timeline. Thank you. Is there anyone who wishes to speak against Article 11? No? Mm -hmm. Question? Lawrence O'Neill again. I noticed in the capital plan that the estimated replacement cost is 130000 for this vehicle, and we're being asked to authorize 175. Why is there a $45,000 difference? So somebody can answer Lawrence's question? I don't, I don't know when that $130,000 number was placed into the capital plan. That may be a number that needs to be updated. I think that basically my answer to that question would be you're going to be pushing $130,000 in the cost of the truck, and then by the time you outfit it with the dump and the plow and everything else that you're going to be purchasing, you're going to be looking at about one hundred and seventy-five. So that's the reality. I, I, I get your point that it doesn't mesh with the number that was in the capital plan, but that's an older plan. So. There was one other hand up here, and the woman with the purple over here on the right. Thank you, Janet Goldstein. Um, it says not to exceed $175,000, and I think it's pretty clear that we would like you to spend way less than that if possible um, this time around. So, and I'd like to, can we call the question? Are we allowed to do you that? You may call the question, yes. Right, I would like to call the question right. at this time. And do we have a second? Second Robin seconded. Uh, the question has been called and questioned. Sorry, the second, the question, sorry. The question has been called and seconded. It is non-debatable and it requires a two-thirds majority. All those in favor of calling the question, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, please say nay. Question has been called. We are now moving to a vote. Um, Article 11, to see if the town will vote to authorize the select board to borrow an amount not to exceed 175000 to purchase a dump truck for the highway department to be repaid over a period of not more than five years. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. All those opposed, please say nay. Nay. It appears that the ayes have it. The ayes have it, and Article 11 passes. We are now moving on to Article 12. To elect three trustees to the Putney Public Library Board. Do we have a motion, which is, I'm understanding that it's going to be a slate. I'm not quite sure how this one works. I'm confused every year. Is, is there a representative from the library here? Yes. yes. Yeah. Janice, would you like to move this question? Yes. Would you like to move the question? Can we get a second and then we'll hear the slate? The second is Lionel. Um. Thank you, so I could either just read the names or I, I think to be more complete, amend the article to read more fully. May I do that? I'm looking at my parliamentarian. Can we just, do we want to do a formal amendment to put in the names? Well, to change the wording. To change the wording? It includes the date and the names. Okay. In order of his moderator. Yes, uh, point of Robert's order. Rules, Robert's rules require that uh, the nominations also be heard from the floor, so the nominees would not be in the, uh, in the motion. Right. So, um, did everybody, can, can, can Ro, Ro, I'm sorry, can Howard get a mic because I wanted to say that again so that everybody can hear that? Janice, maybe you can just give it to Howard for a second. Uh, Ms. Moderator, I raise a point of order. Uh, Robert's rules require that 
that nominations be heard, nominations, if any, also be heard from the floor. So it would not be appropriate for, to make a motion in which the people to be elected are, in fact, uh, named, because in that case, we would be excluding anybody who could be nominated from the floor. Uh, that makes sense to me. In which case, I'm going to suggest that what we do is we take nominations from the floor now and then um, create a slate from those and then we will vote on the slate. So may I nominate? So you may now mo nominate somebody and perhaps there will be others who wish to nominate. May I nominate three people? Yes. 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 <laughs> so I would like to nominate um, for the three seats that will expire March 2022, Deidre Kelly, and you have the correct spelling of that name, Maggie Smith, and Janice Baldwin. Okay, great. So we have three nominations. We are going to treat them as a slate. There are three seats. And there are three seats. Does anybody have any questions before we proceed? Um, not a parliamentarian. This seems very strange to me. I think nominations have to be seconded individually when they come from the floor. That's my understanding of Robert's rules, number one. Number two is one of the nominations is a self-nomination, and I don't know if they have to be seconded. So I'm raising a couple questions. My understanding of this, and this comes from Marlboro College's use of, of uh, nominations, nominations do not need to be seconded. However, if somebody does not wish to, who has been nominated, does not wish to be uh, elected, now is your time to say, I respectfully decline. So that is where we get a little bit of a check on the names. There is no problem with somebody nominating themselves at all. Uh, so that should not be held against anybody. And did I answer both your questions? So I think we're okay with this as long as everybody understands what it is we're doing. Do we have any other questions? Yes. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that um, it might be proper to, to move, yes. and I would move that the moderator, um, that the moderator cast one vote in favor of the slate. Okay. I like that idea. What does the parliamentarian say? You have to first ask if there are any other nominations to the floor. Yes. And you'll get a quick hand count either way, and you can just, I mean, vote either way. And it's, it's not worth spending time. Okay. So, if I'm, is there, are there any other nominations, first of all? Seeing no more nominations, I move that the slate of Deidre Kelly, Maggie Smith, and Janice Baldwin um, be the, I move that they be the slate. Can I get a second? Yes. Uh, Nancy Olson has seconded. And we are now going to vote on the slate of candidates for the trustees to the Putney Public Library Board. All those in favor of that slate, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, please indicate by saying nay. It appears that the ayes have it, and those three candidates have been elected to the Putney Public Library Board. We are now moving on to Article 13 to see if the town will vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $1,475,102 to defray its expenses and liabilities for the town general fund ensuing fiscal year July 1st, 2019 to June 30th, 2020. Do I have a motion? Move. And can you just say your name? Paul Gustafson Putney. Paul Gustafson. And do we have a second? Norm Barber. Norm Barber. What was the last name, Norm? Barber. Barber. 
It has been moved and seconded for Article 13 to see if the town will vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $1,475,102 to defray its expenses and liabilities for the town general fund ensuing fiscal year July 1st, 2019 to June 30th, 2020. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. Uh, this is Lionel. I know that the I know that these budgets are super complicated. And there are a lot of different parts to them, um, but it would appear from the from the report that uh, there's a significant increase in in spending, for, at, at least on paper. So, I, I could you please um, let us know if in fact this budget is significantly higher than last year's? and how, how it compares to last year's. Thank you. Hi, Lionel. Um, so on paper, it appears it is higher, but it's actually 1% for the general fund. Um, somebody, somebody told me to follow the money. So what happens is with the grants, um, so there's revenue in, for grants, but you also have the expense on the other side, and that's the increase on paper. And that, in the past, wasn't always done that way. So it is about a 1% on the general fund increase in the budget from last year. As, a, as opposed to the, what appears to be 15.92% that's printed, and that's correct. It's just relative to, as Karen said, time frame of grant money. Any other questions? Yes, in the back. Uh, Jim Oliver. Um, I, I bring this up, it's a relatively small line item, but it's, it's the kind of thing that it's important to me. Um, uh, there is on page 39 under intergovernmental agency assessments a line for SEBEDS appropriation of something over $8,000. Uh, this is an organization, as I understand it, that does uh, economic development uh, work uh, in Wyndham County. And it's something that's been a discussion at previous town meetings. Uh, and it's been voted down in the past. Incorrect. Voted oh, sorry. Been voted up all three years, I believe. Yes. Okay, I'm sorry. Well, here's my, I guess my point remains. Then, then I'll. It's not a question. I, I it's a statement I'd, I'd like to make. Um, there, there is, uh, there was when I was on the select board many years ago a real problem, which was that that all kinds of social service agencies. This, Perhaps is a little different, but all kinds of social service agencies came to the select board and said, we have this vital, important function that needs to be performed in Wyndham County. And there wasn't any good way for the board to decide whether uh, animal rescue was more important than uh, Putney Cares or, you know, there were just all of these different organizations vying for, for money from the town. And I guess I would put this one in the same category. And in order to deal with this in what seemed like a fair way, uh, we divided the, the different organizations up into uh, different categories. And these appear on page... Uh, 48. Thanks, on page, page 48. 48. Yeah. Uh, with the ones that are located in Putney, getting the largest share of the funds set aside for social service agencies and those in the second group that uh, were deemed to, to provide substantial services, getting a, a part of the pie, and then a third group uh, getting um, uh, less. And the idea being that the, the select board and for that matter, the town, the town meeting doesn't have to decide every time how to prioritize all of these different organizations. I think that this organization, this organization should be dealt with in the same way. And I would 
think that they should be in the third of those three categories. Um, in that context, I would vote against this appropriation. Um, it's unclear. There's two paragraphs in the, the information at the end uh, in the town report where each of the organizations says what it does. Some very general information. $8,000 isn't a lot of money in the long run, but we spent quite a bit of time talking about where the, uh, the Yellow Barn <coughs> ought to get a uh, uh, tax exemption that was worth $900. It's worth 10 times that. Um, I, I guess I'll stop talking to say I oppose. Uh, have, I would like to remove this item from this line item from the budget. So, um, and, and when this happens like this, and I'm looking at Tom just to work our way through it. So this is a recommendation to remove that line item from the budget, which is in the, which is in the. That you, you, you can't do that. Oh. It doesn't, it doesn't. You, you, in a general fund budget, you cannot remove a specific line item. You could reduce well, the total by- Yeah, that's what I was gonna to get to. Okay. So, that the, so that the piece that can happen is we would change the number, we would reduce uh, the number, uh oh, where'd it go? 1,475,102, we, we would subtract the amount that is being given, that has been allocated for seven, and then, that would be an amendment that I would be looking for a second on. Is, is that, I'm looking, first I gotta find out if Tom thinks I'm doing this correctly. Uh, my understanding is you can't only rely on it on the school budget, but on a, on a town budget, you can't. I, you, you, well, I, I could be wrong, you might be right, Tom, but my understanding is you can reduce the total amount by the amount that you intend, it's up to the discretion of the select board to decide whether we take that money out of that line item or take it out of elsewhere. Um, I, if I could speak to the bigger question, though, um, this is something that we have. Wait, to, uh, wait I just got. I just have to sorry. clarify that I have the right moment in procedurally because we do had we do had this uh, recommendation, which I'm treating as an amendment, to reduce it by the amount that we have allocated for seven. And then I heard a second, was that correct? Yeah, so Eva jumped in as a second. So now we really, I think, need to be addressing this as an amendment to Article 13. And now, Josh, if you would like to say something about the amendment. I, this has been a point of discussion for the select board, not surprisingly. Um, we opted this year, having had this discussion from the floor, as an individual article for the last three years and it getting voted up each time, we decided this year to, in the interest of potentially saving time at town meeting, um, <laughs> to include it as a light I line item. We do not agree with you, Jim, that, that, or I certainly do not agree with you that this should be in the social, social services agency. We have RJ here from SEDEDS who uh, we might want to invite to speak to this but they aren't a social services provider, so they're not a social services agency. Does that mean we should be providing them with this allocation? That's up to the voters to decide, not up to me to decide, but it is very clear to me and has been to the select board that this in fact is not a social service agency and therefore does not fit into that social services contributions category. So I just wanna make that perfectly clear. The debate about whether to spend that money on SEVEDS or not is still a valid debate. Um, if we'd like to invite, but, but again, we voted it up three years in a row. We thought it was time to put it in as a line item and maybe not have to discuss it. But. So, so we're, we are now though discussing it as an amendment and I've got two hands up, maybe there's others. Uh, Lawrence. Hi folks. Um, then, I was aware that last year this was Article 11, it was hotly debated, so I did a little research. I called the Brown Road Development Credit Corporation, who connected me with Sevitz, who connected me with Sarah Lang, who referred me to Mr. Brown, who's sitting over there. I asked him to come to make sure when he came that he brought information that was specific to the town of Putney, not the glittering generalities about what's done for Wyndham County, not what's done for the area, not what's done for the towns that do not contribute, because there are towns that do not pay or pay less than we do per capita. 
Um, specifically, Brattleboro voted it to, I think it was $2 per head, as opposed to $3 for us. Westminster doesn't contribute anything, etc. So I asked him to come and address what we get for our money that we wouldn't get if we don't give any money. So with that, I would like to invite Mr. Brown to address that. And hearing oh. no objections, because Mr. Brown, I'm assuming, since you're sitting on that side of the chain, uh, if there are no objections, I am inviting Mr. Brown to come and speak on 7th. Would you give him a mic? Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Um, and thank you for allowing me the uh, opportunity to speak to you, speak to you today. Um, so I am here representing Seventh Southeastern Vermont Economic Development Strategies. If, if I could just take 30 seconds to provide a sort of high-level overview of what we are. It's the, the regional economic development entity in the region. The BDCC is. SEVIDS is a sister organization that informs the work we do. SEVIDS has a board and drives and sets the, the economic development roadmap for the region. In contracts with the BDCC, to get those that work done and develop pro programming. To to answer the specific question of, of you know who do we touch within the town of, to, of Putney, my area of focus is on um, startup businesses, small business services in the region, entrepreneurship. And in this past year, calendar year, I have had 13 engagements with um, small businesses and early stage uh, firms. Um, we have our Young Professionals Organization, which um, there are five members uh, within the town of Putney. Um, we have done workforce-related initiatives with uh, Soundview Paper. Um, I've had several engagements with Landmark College. Uh, we've worked with Five Maples, the direct um, uh, mail and marketing firm. Uh, again, our Young Professionals Organization has done uh, two events at the Gleanery. One of them is, uh, you know, they focus on, on young folk in the region. Um, uh, one of them was a uh, home buying workshop as well as a tax preparation workshop. Um, I know town leadership has attended one of our capacity building um, events called the Connectivity Summit. Um, and, and I want to take a moment and focus on, on the programs that we have in the schools. We have Fast Tracks to Education, which exposes our kids throughout the region, um, and, and kids here go to Brattleboro Union High School, and, and some also go to Leland and Gray. Um, that Fast Tracks ex exposes kids to what opportunities are available in the region. Um, so that they know what's here. Should they not necessarily be college bound? Or if they're college bound, they know that they could return and be an engineer at one of the firms uh, that's in the region. We also, um, in listening to the schools, because of our direct work with the schools, understand that the counselors don't have the capacity to, to give the kids all the attention they need. So we take the municipal funding that's provided to us and leverage that to get other grant funding. And this is an, a, a perfect example. So we have a dedicated resource that's not funded through the school budgets, but through us, that spends one day a week in each high school throughout the region. In Brattleboro Union High School, they focus on the helping kids develop their personalized learning, uh, personalized learning plans, which is a state requirement. In Bells Falls, for example, um, every student within the Bells Falls High School has a resume that's, that's created. Alex Beck, my colleague, is, uh, is the gentleman that helps them do that. Um, Westminster did fund us. They did fund us last year at a reduced rate, but also they funded us this year at, at, as, at a reduced rate as well. So I hope that answers specific questions. Oh, one other question, if you don't mind, I'll address very briefly. What happens if you don't fund us? Um, or towns that don't fund us, will, will we still provide you services? Yes, of course, we'll I guess it's like a parent's love. We'll still provide you services. However, that will only last for so long because the funding, as I said, helps leverage other funding. And if we don't have that funding, then we can't get other funding in order to do the work that we do. So you might not notice it in a year. It might take two years. But in the end, that work will start to diminish because we won't be able to employ the staff to, work with, to, to focus on, on those specific programmatic areas. Great. Thank you. So just to remind us, what we're doing is we are deliberating on the amendment 
which would be to reduce the, the total sum in Article 13 by 8,106. Is there somebody who wishes to speak against the amendment? I don't know if you've heard that. I, I really appreciate the explanation that we just got, because I, I recall the, the consternation that many of us were feeling last year about um, the, the organization and whether or not we really were getting any benefit out of it. And, and uh, I really appreciate now having a clear sense of the value that we get. I know, uh, we all know that regionally and even at a large scale throughout New England, there are serious issues facing uh, all of these small towns in terms of uh, kids moving away and not coming back, um, schools getting smaller and having to merge, um, businesses going away. Uh, there's tremendous threats facing us as we look to the future if we're not proactive and smart. And I, and I believe the organization um, said is, is, is a great thing for us. So I, I, would, I would recommend that we vote this one, this amendment down. Great. Is there somebody who wishes to speak for the amendment who hasn't spoken already? Question. We have a question in the back. Sorry, Janice Baldwin. I have a question for our civets uh, representative. I know a little bit about your work. Um, I'm aware of some of your technical assistant grants and other things. I'm curious if you reach out to um, struggling businesses or you know that you might be aware of in your in our community that you know their room is they're closing and aren't doing so well. Do you reach out to them to see if there's assistance that you can provide? That could um, could help and support them, or do you wait for people to come to you, or or not? If, if there is a, a known entity that um, is on our radar, I I, I will reach out. Um, oftentimes, though, do we do need people to communicate with us? You know, we're a uh, limited staff representing 44,000 people within the county um, but but certainly if, if there's something that I know about that I feel like one of our programs can help uh, facilitate uh, some sort of help you know I of course we reach out Wait, Janice can you get the mic sorry business but you're at a party and a neighbor says I hear that you know XYZ clothing store is going to be closing down again. That's really too bad because we love them. And um, you know, do you then pick the phone and say, "Hey, can I help you?" or "What do you need?" or does it have to be something more formal than that? Want well, to go ahead and answer that? And we'll take another question. I I, I I'm just speaking for 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 the way I operate, and and, and so yes, I would. If, if there's a specific use case, I'd love to, you know, talk to you afterwards. So we have a question here in front with Emily. Actually, it's a it's a comment. Mm -hmm. um, I have um, approached Seveds often um, with my partner Tom. We've been uh, looking to bring this carbon sequestering natural building material to the area uh, called Hempcrete and. But just as a, a point of information, um, I haven't gotten any help that I need, and I do need help, and I'm telling you this so you will reach out to Hempfully Green. Uh, we're starting a, a, a tiny house project, and frankly, business is in, it's just a hard thing to do for, uh, for myself and my partner, and this is an extremely important um, material, we believe, for the area. So I just wanted to put that out there. I'm not going for against the, you are, but okay. okay. Because I, might, I might have read it as four, but that's all right. Um, well, anyone, well, it's a challenge. Yeah. Is there somebody who wants to speak against the amendment? Jordy? No? Do you, you have a friendly amendment? Uh, well, I agree with Jim that, that we are overfunding this organization. Uh, when we look at Putney Cares or Putney Community Cares and the other local organizations which get in the order of $5,000 each, um, I would like to make the friendly amendment that we 
fund SEBITS this year at $3 per voter present today and voting now. So that that would reduce the, uh, the budget by whatever the math came out to be. Do you have that number, Jordy? Let's say there's, there's not 150 people here, but let's say there are, so. Uh, As of 2.30, 215 Putney voters have voted. So what, what if, I'm trying to figure out, because we now have an amendment to an amendment, and, right. you're, and you're proposing instead of 8,106, what number are you proposing? Uh, 8,106 minus, uh, if there were 150 people here, minus 700, and, no. 450. Um, so so reduce it by whatever that is. Yeah. So we, we would we would give keep in the budget for them four hundred and fifty dollars. And I don't have a uh, so I'm, I'm still I, for some reason I'm having a hard time maybe because it's after lunch and it's getting late. I, I want I, to I, know I, what the number is that I should be saying is the amended amount. Um, 8,106 minus 450, and that's the, <laughs> I don't have that one. So what is the number? Can somebody do the math? Alan? Can you say that? Can we give him the mic so I can hear? 7,656. 7656. Okay. So we're taking that as an amendment to the amendment. Do I have a second on the amendment to the amendment? So we have a second on the amendment to the amendment. Can you say your name, please? All right. So we have an amendment that has been seconded. We are now deliberating on. So now the new number that is that I was hoping was your uh, amendment is that the reduction in the amount of this sum is 7,656. Okay, and we had a second from John Frick. Yes. Okay, so it, and it was a request for a friendly amendment. Again, that's a little bit dicey. I'm gonna say I will take it as a friendly amendment if the um secondary amendment. Okay, this is as far as we're going, right? This is Jordy's is a secondary amendment. Yes. We can't take this uh, tertiary. No, we're not doing a tertiary. We're, we're we're treating it as a friendly amendment, which means I'm now going back to oops, I forgot your name. Jim Oliver. Jim Oliver, if I put in my fingers. So Jim Oliver, do you accept that as a friendly amendment? If I understand the amendment to say that the, uh, the amount that's currently in the budget would be reduced by 7,000 something. Yes. Yes. And Eva was the second on yours. Eva, do you take that from the amendment? Yes. Okay, so now it is. We are debating this amendment to the amendment. Yes, Benji. Hi, Benji Cragen. I'd like to, um, this is against both amendments, no offense. Um, I would rather get a less fancy truck, uh, put that money in, and quite frankly, give some more money to Putney Cares. Um, we can't look at this as just Putney. Um, I don't know how many of you work in Brattleboro, work in Dummerston, work 40 miles away. Um, it's if, if the whole region is not working, then we're not working. Um, I said this last year, but it, it's my best argument. Frank, frankly, what we do really well is educate young people and then they leave. Um, I got two kids who you ask them, hey, what about coming back here and working? And they just laugh at me and say, what am I gonna do here? And if we don't have, and I'll say it again, I don't know how much of a difference this makes, but we've got to do something, okay? Because town meeting is, you know, we're all graying, we're all balding, uh, where the young people, they're not here. So we need to, we need to invest, you know? I know where some of them are. 
anyways, I think this is a small investment that, um, you know, I have my fingers crossed that will pay dividends. So I'm going to have that as against the amendment. Is there somebody who wishes to speak for the, and I'm calling it a friendly amendment, so it's no longer an amendment to the amendment. It's now the reduction of the amount of 7656. Is there somebody who wishes to speak um, in favor of the amendment? Um, I'm a little yeah. confused as to whether I'm speaking for or against the amendment at the moment. Um, I think that um, I am certainly in favor of uh, spending money to um, favor our economy locally. I think what uh, I'm objecting to, and possibly everybody else may be objecting to, is the fact that it was created as a line item um, without our um, ability to discuss it, which we're obviously doing now. Um, so I, I would urge the select board next year to put it back on the floor um, as instead of a line item um, so that we can fully discuss it. Um, and um, I, I'm, I'm actually on the fence as to whether I'm for or against this at this point, at this point in time. Uh, I've got a bunch of hands up in Carol, is that right? Yes, if we can get the mic back to Carol. And then... Carolyn. Carolyn, sorry. And then we'll go to you. Her hand was up there. Um, I agree that uh, we all have absolutely no idea whether this really makes a difference. And I don't know about you, but I don't, I, I, that doesn't make me comfortable after three years of really putting it in the budget as a line item again. And I think, um, I think there's a responsibility to present us with some data. I don't know if you do any evaluation, but these are reasonable things that organizations do to try to measure impact. And in the total absence of that kind of information, I think it's really hard to vote to keep this as a line, line item in the budget. So we're going to move to, is it Julie? Janet. Janet, sorry. Janet, and then I know you've been waiting. Janet Goldstein, I'm one of probably the 13 people that you spoke of that came in and used the services at Sevens, and I spoke um, couple of times in person and a bunch of times in email and it was very helpful in um, you're on my list of things to do as I'm starting a new business and to go back and get more help and they've, they've been very helpful over the years for me I think um, you know we should leave it as it is for this year and if people are really against the way that it is on the line item then there are select board meetings that happen all year long, and we should go to a select board meeting and make our, um, our wishes known there. Great. And so, Laura? So, I know that Sevens has been working a lot with our town manager. And I Can you hear her? Can you hear me? No. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So I know that Sevens has been working a lot with our town manager, and I'd really like to hear from her um, what her experiences have been. And so I focused on the storefronts that are vacant or have been vacant, and I do utilize BDCC, which is affiliated, correct me if I'm wrong, with Sevens. They contract with Sevens. And I've had business owners come into the office and say, what am I going to do? And I'm like, here's Adam Grinnell's name, his contact information. I would advise you, recommend you to call him. So Cotton Mill Hill is a incubator that has businesses down there. And from what I understand, they try to place them in the community. I can only do so much. But BDCC and Sevens, they request certain information that I don't want to give them from, you know, the property owner needs to reach out to the organization. They are there, they know Putney, and they do have a sense of what's going on. So, and we heard last year as well, there was like two or three people that stood up 
in favor of BDC C and Sevitz because they have helped them out as well. Um, they are both working together. They are an economic development group, and right now everybody is struggling. Mount Snow, they have um, quarterly meetings up there for economic development. Everyone is invited, the public, and I stress this that owners have, to, you can come to the town hall, I can give you information, contact the people, and you can work with them directly. So I've had a good experience with them, and I would continue to use them even if this line item wasn't in the budget. So just a reminder that we are deliberating on the amendment, which is to reduce the sum of a million four hundred seventy-five thousand one hundred two dollars by seven thousand six hundred fifty-six. Is there anybody else who wishes to speak on the amendment? Yes, um, Billy in the back, and then we'll move to Lionel in the front. I just had a quick question, which is, what is the annual budget? Like, what percentage of the budget is Putney being asked to fund? Do we have an answer to that question? Yeah. Uh. Can you get the mic? I, I believe, but I'd be more comfortable saying I could get you that information, but I believe it's around 10% of the overall budget. No, sorry. No, don't be. I might have articulated that incorrectly. <laughs> <laughs> giving it to my colleagues. If, if you all don't mind, so our <laughs> municipal can fund... You just, can you just introduce yourself? My name is Alex Beck and I'm the Workforce and Education Program Manager. So hearing no objections, I invite Alex Beck to speak. Yes. Yeah. So um, our municipal fundraising is about half of the total, maybe, maybe uh, you know, a, a little less, or a little more than a third of the SEVEDS budget. Um, the rest of that is in grants and um, we ask all the communities in Wyndham County um, for the same amount of money and as people have mentioned sometimes they change so um, the municipality as a whole is are responsible for at least half if not a bit more of the total SEVEDS budget um, and you're playing your role within that. What is the budget? What is the whole budget? Um, I believe it's uh, just over um, $200,000 uh, a year for SEVEDS, and again, most of that is uh, USDA and other uh, grant funding. So this is the only unrestricted funding um, SEVEDS has um, compared to grant funding, which is completely restricted. We could not spend that um, on opportunities that weren't you know, already outlined in the grant. So I'm, I'm, st I'm, Lionel had his hand up and then I'm beginning to move to us to a vote on the amendment, although I got two hands up in the back. I just, uh, just want to clarify um, that we're voting uh, to possibly decrease the budget, but we cannot require or force in any way the selectmen to act on this reduction of funding if it's passed in the way that we are suggesting and so if we do go ahead and reduce the budget um, we, we should not assume that that will result in the outcome that people are hoping for uh, can we go back to steve vorheis and then to eva this feels unique um steve worries we're here in putney um, a couple of years ago i uh, sought uh, some advice from the organization we met um, concerning starting a maker space in, in this town. I am still wanting to do that. My own energy has stalled with it uh, somewhat, um, particularly uh, when Daniel Hogus left the area. That was some sort of degree of partnership with crime of, um, making it happen, he's more inclined to move to uh, move the concept to Bellows Falls. That's too far for me. Um, so it is a way of actually Putney having a 
you know, a, a general relationship to this organization that could benefit everyone here, depending on how you would want to participate. Makerspace would start with uh, carpentry and, and, and metalworking and sewing and um, commercial kitchen, for instance. Those were my you know, prime ideas of development. Um, so this could have you know, immediate um, um, importance. And I, as a footnote, I ask anyone interested in pursuing this to contact me and, and we can further uh, a button oriented makerspace of, of that nature. Um, so I, I tend to be in favor of, of an organization that can benefit doing stuff here in, in Putney and drawing people in, particularly young people or retired people, you know, who don't have space at home to, you know, or the, the investment on their own to invest in a whole shop to do, you know, just a few little projects. Yeah. So that's my, that's my plea of relevance. Great. So we'll move right back to Eva. And then we're going to start to move us towards the vote. Well, I had a question. I wonder how many towns in Wyndham County fund this organization? How many towns? Wait, wait. I want to hear that. Can we get a mic? There's not that much money for a runner, so I'll wait. Got it. Okay. Great. Let's Hello, just, okay, so as my colleague referenced, we asked the same of every town within the Wyndham region. Um, last year, we received uh, funding from 13 towns representing 75% um, of the uh, residents within Wyndham County. Do you have another question? How many towns? Yeah. Thir 13. Thir thir out, of thir how many, out of 32 towns? No, there's 20... 32. Okay. Do you have another question, Eva, or did you want to say something about I, I, the amendment? I just want to say the idea that children don't come back and so on. The emphasis we put on college, and we have such a shortage of people, electricians and plumbers, and so when we say to our children, we understand that you're not coming back. Maybe we need to say, come back, We're need, you're needed. Good pay for electrician, great pay, pay for a plumber, I know, yeah. So I'm thinking that we can start to vote on the amendment. That's what we're going to be voting on. Um, so this is for Article 13 as amended, in which case to see if the town will vote to raise and appropriate the sum of, and now you'll have to do math in your heads, 1,475,102.00 minus 76.56. That's 7656 to defray its expenses and liabilities for the town general fund ensuing fiscal year July 1st, 2019 through June 30th, 2020. All those in favor of the amendment. Okay. What? I think we're only voting on the amendment. Right. right. All those in favor of the amendment. Oh, sorry. Of the amended language. Just the amended language. But I, I felt, I generally feel like I need to read it as amended, but we're just voting on the amendment. Thank you for that clarification. All those in favor of the amendment, please indicate by saying aye. 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 All those opposed to the amendment, please indicate by saying nay. Nay. The, it appears the nays have it. The nays have it and the amendment does not pass. We are now moving back to Article 13 uh, as it was originally written. Yes, Howard. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Moderator, as you know, uh, by rearrangement with Putney Public Library trustees and director, I shall be moving to, to amend the library's fiscal 2019-2020 budget. For clarity, my motion refers to the next to last line on page 44 of the 2018 town report. If my motion is seconded, I would like to ask the library director or a trustee 
to explain officially the reason for this prearranged motion and answer any questions. I move that the FY 2020 digital content line item of the Putney Public Library budget 2019-2020 be increased from $2,775 to $3,671 to include the $896 annual cost of a public library's online subscription to Consumer Reports. Thank you. Does everybody find that on page 44? The changes? We also are going to need a second. I just want to make sure we're on the same page. We have a second. Yes. Uh, Jean Giddings, is that a second? Yes. So the, it has been moved and seconded to increase from $2,775 to $3,671 uh, the digital content line. Point of clarification. Yes. Uh, the, this, as with the same discussion we just had about the SEVEDS money, would be a recommendation because the library budget is an allocation within the general fund budget. This would be a recommendation, in fact, to, re to increase the general fund budget by that amount. And again, it would be a recommendation to the select board, not the addition of money to a specific line item. So, uh, j just to clarify that, this library budget is printed here so that you all have it, but it's incorporated within the general fund budget. So it's an appropriate time to discuss it because this is a general fund item, but same laws, same rules apply. So this suggests, if I'm hearing you correctly, is that we need, that the, what we're actually talking about is an amendment, Howard's amendment, I'll call it, that has been seconded, that would be, uh, um, that you would be increasing it by, the $1,475,102 would be increased by $896. Correct. Does everybody understand that that's what we're talking about? Uh, I've got several hands up. Howard has requested that uh, Emily Service speak on this. Is that all right? I'm going to, hearing no objections, then I'm going to ask Emily Service, our Putney librarian, to come forward. Hi everybody. Um, I am in support of Howard's amendment to add the money for the, for the digital content item of the Consumer Reports database. All the digital content items that are represented in that line, including the one that Howard has suggested, are things that you can all access from home with your library card number. Um, the Consumer Reports database is a really useful item. I was hoping to add it to next fiscal year's budget. Um, this year, we also see another increase in that line because we're adding the Mango languages, or proposing to add the Mango languages, uh, language learning software, which you can also all access from home. So, um, again, I'm, I'm in support of this amendment. This was, it was Howard's idea, but this was something that I was hoping to add anyway, and I think that it would see a lot of use in Puppy. Great. Uh, we've got a couple of hands up. I think Julie had her hand up. Is that right? No? No, I want to look it up. Okay, and Lionel? Uh, just in the interest of expedience, is it possible to simply pass the existing budget as it stands and find that additional $800 somewhere? Uh, well, we'd have to take it out of somewhere else. So, yeah, yes, technically it is, but if we all agree that increasing the library but or increasing the general fund budget by this amount, with the interest of this purpose, that would give us pretty clear guidance. Sounds like, given a choice, you'd prefer to see the budget raised at this time. Okay. Otherwise, we just got to come up with it elsewhere. Okay. Which, but, uh, but I thank you for the sentiment. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, so just to be clear, we're now voting on this amendment, which would be to raise by $896. Uh, is there any other comments? Otherwise, I think we may be able to move to a vote on this amendment. Okay, uh, we are now voting on the amendment to Article 13 to see if the town will vote to raise and appropriate the sum of 1,475,102.00 plus $896 to defray its expenses and liabilities for the town general fund ensuing fiscal year. All those in favor of this amendment, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, please indicate by saying nay. 
It appears that the ayes have it. The ayes have it, and the amendment now passes. So we are now, does somebody want to do the math for me so that I can now go back to the article and I can actually say something rather than give you math equations? Nine. So we are now going back to Article 13. Thank you, Nancy. To see if the town will vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $1,475,998 to defray its expenses and liabilities for the town general fund ensuing fiscal year July 1st, 2019 to June 30th, 2020. Do we have any other questions, concerns about this article? Yes, Julie. Janet. Janet, Janet. I'm sorry. It's like it gets in my head. It's okay. No worries. Janet. Janet Goldstein. I have waited all day for this moment. Yeah. I am on the Animal Advisory Board for the town. We have been tasked with the um, revamping and looking at the town ordinance for animal control. There have been instances over the last year and a half that have been very serious, uh, resulting in death, resulting in high medical bills and attacks. And so, we have been, we have no animal control officer, and we have been utilizing our town manager, we have been utilizing our sheriff, and I propose that the town, we have $1,800 uh, allotted under public safety on page 38. You'll see that there's $1,800 in the budget. Um, we can't hire anybody. We can't find anybody for $1,800 a year. And so I'm proposing that, you know, if you go and you buy a dump truck and it's not $178,000, that maybe some of that money can be deferred towards um, helping us hire somebody that is um, trained and able to do the job of animal control officer. We need signs in town. We would like to put um, doggy waste bags at town hall for people to collect if they need them so that they can clean up after their dogs. There are things that we would like to do. $1,800 is not a lot of money. So, so are you actually making an amendment or is it a request I, I, to the select board? I'm making a request to the select board that they somehow find more money to put on that line item somehow because we we need an animal control officer we can make well we're, we're working on the ordinance and there will be an ordinance out for everybody hopefully in the next few months for people to look at and for the select board to vote on um, but we need to hire somebody and eighteen hundred dollars is just not going to cut it, at least right now as it stands. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. We have a hand up right next to Oh, Josh, did you want to respond to that? I did. I, I just would say I, I want to say thank you very much to the Animal Control Board, Animal Advisory Board. They've been very busy working through our uh, our uh, ordinance, etc. Uh, historically, our problem finding an animal control officer, and I, I, I don't want to disagree with you, Janet, because I because I agree we need an animal control officer. Historically, it's not been about money; it's been about the reality of just getting somebody to do it. Um, we have had a number of different people who have done it for very short periods of time over the last X number of years. We just can't hang on to them. It's a it's a much, in my opinion, it's a much greater problem than town of Putney. What I would actually ask you all to do is to speak to your legislators. This is a statewide problem. It's a huge problem. In my opinion, it should be under the purview of the Wyndham County Sheriff's Department. We've spoken about this with Keith Clark numerous times. They are not opposed to doing it, but they don't have the funding to do it either. Um, you know, For one town to try and support an animal control officer, unless we were to put you know, a full-time salary line item in there. It, it, it's less about money than it is about the logistics of finding somebody, and it's a it's a more of a regional problem in my opinion. But I but I hear what you're saying, and I and we do think about how to solve that problem. We just don't have a great solution. 
All right, is there any other thing? Otherwise, I think we are going to move to a vote on Article 13. Looks like we're ready to move to a vote on Article 13 to see if the town will vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $1,475,102 to defray its expenses and liabilities for the town general fund ensuing fiscal year July 1st, 2019 to June 30th, 2020. Point of order. That's a point of order, yes. Amended. The last three figures oh. are were amended to 998. To 998, excuse me, I'm sorry. So as amended to $1,475,998. Yes. Uh, all those in favor of Article 13 as amended, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, please indicate by saying nay. It appears that the ayes have it. The ayes have it, and Article 13, as amended, is passed. Uh, I need to take just a very, very short recess, really, really short, um, and so I'm going to recommend five minutes tops, a time to stretch, etc. Okay, this is what we call the tried and true. Here we are. Approaching four o'clock. This is the serious town meeting attenders. You all deserve badges. Bye, Alex. We'll wait for everybody to get back up on the stage who needs to be there. Sir. Do we have everybody up? I think so, we got our, okay, we've got a full assortment here on the stage. We are now moving to Article 14, to see if the town will vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $1,490,436 to defray its expenses and liabilities for the highway fund, ensuing fiscal year July 1st, 2019 through June 30th, 2020. Do we have a motion? So moved. Josh, and do we have a second? And Norman Bartlett. Roland Bartlett? Norman. Norman Bartlett, sorry Norman. It has been moved and seconded. We are now, uh, okay, do we have any questions first about Article 14? Yes, Lawrence. The highway budget went up some $300,000 and I'm having difficulty finding that as line items. Can we get some sort of explanation as to where that money's going? So again, Lawrence, it's um, on paper. It's less than 1% increase from last year. Um, again, there's two grants that we're looking at. One's a paving grant, and then the other one is for structures. It is. It's a 175 and uh, 275 for the paving. And what page are you all on? Um, we're on page 43, actually. Thank you. You're saying the town contribution is only one percent. The, 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 the budget, the overall, yes. The amount to be raised by taxes, in fact, has only changed by 1%. It's, it's very confusing. I don't think we'll do it this way again, Lawrence. I, I, I think it's, the intention is good and appropriate, et cetera, but it's hard to make sense of unless you really know what you're looking at. So, Lawrence, on page 41, intergovernmental grants. In there, you'll see the paving grant and you'll see the structures grant as revenue, okay? The town also has to match, like 20%. So in the expenditures, you'll see that those numbers on the other side. And that will be under, on page 42, under grant projects, you have Houghton Brook Road, that will be replaced this year for 200,000. And then the paving grant is under retreat or something. Where is that one? 
Oh, right. Retreat. Yeah, just below that is retreatment at 275. Now, if we don't get those grants, if the money doesn't come in through the revenue, then the project doesn't get done. So taxes are not raised on that money. So, so for all practical purposes, this is outside of, it, it's sort of oddly outside of the budget, but it fits into the budget because we do receive the money. Right. But it's not money raised from taxes. So. Lawrence, can you get a mic just because we're not able to hear what you're saying? I'm looking at the variance percentage and variance dollar amount, and the 175 that you're talking about on structures wasn't carried over. So should that have been carried over to make it a total of 350,000 right there instead of 175? And that would account, that would account for that difference? No, because last year we had a $175,000 grant as well. So that's why it doesn't show as a variance. If you look at FY1920 budget, there's 175,000 in there. And then if you look at 2021 budget, there's 175,000 in there. So it doesn't, why it shows as a 100% variance, I don't know, because in fact, it's not a variance. Um, but that's why it's not shown on the last line. That 100%, that 100% shown in the variance column is inaccurate because the year before we received the same grant. Correct. So the new the new grant for pay, say paving bridge funds that's the hundred that's the variance that's the hundred seventy five variance out of the three hundred fifty or so increase. Correct. So that's, that's part of that increase. Correct. It's part of it. Yes. Okay. And then yes. where's the rest of it? Um. <laughs> where's the, well another is 175,000. It's just not, it's not a variance, but it changes. You know, yeah, I might be getting in over my head, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, Karen. For the truck. No, the it's the 275, it's the 275 for the other highway project. You can take the mic back from Lawrence. Um, thanks. Yeah, because that's the 475, is the $200,000 for the paving. And then the um, the culvert is 275. So there's your 475. And then there's other changes in here with you know like your benefits. Um, we added you know um, two guys just got um, medical and dental benefits. So that increased substantially too. So it's in here. You got to look at where the variance is. As, as far as that, as far as that variance is concerned, though, if you look at on that uh, page forty-three, the total change from um, of highway expenses from one million one hundred forty-three to one million four hundred ninety, mm -hmm. that reflects the hundred and seventy-five plus the payment, correct? Right. Um, which I don't have that number right in front of me, but it's roughly $350,000. Do we have any other questions about the highway fund budget? Does it seem that we may be ready for a vote? In the back, yes. Can you get a mic just because people can't hear you? Sorry. And just Susan F. again, um, why isn't that potential truck purchase just written in with this budget? Because it's a separate article. We can't vote the same money twice, so it has to be done. If it's a separate article, it has to be voted as two different allotments. Are there any other questions? Looks like we may be ready to vote. We are now voting on Article 14 to see if the town will vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $1,490,436 to defray its expenses and liabilities for the highway fund ensuing fiscal year, July 1st, 2019 through June 30th, 2020. All those in favor of Article 14, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, please indicate by saying nay. It appears that the ayes have it. The ayes have it, and Article 14 passes. We are now moving on to Article 15.
to transact any other town business that may legally come before the annual town meeting. Yes, there was two hands first, Alan and then Jean. So we're trying to sneak in a way to get back to the electric dump truck question. <laughs> uh, so I move that uh, my motion is to see if the town will vote to instruct the select board to consider carbon-free fuel vehicles in the future highway equipment purchases. Are you able to bring that language forward? This is a non-binding resolution. Second. But do we, yes, so we have a second and, what is your last name? Um, so, yes. Um, so let me just read it out for everybody. We are now proposing a resolution, this is not binding, to see if the town will vote to instruct the select board to consider uh -oh, carbon-free fueled vehicles in future highway equipment purchases. Yes, did you want to make an amendment? Sure. We may propose an amendment. Um, well, my proposed amendment would be uh, to additionally seek out methods to sequester the carbon cost of running our uh, town equipment. Can you provide us with language? Sorry, because I'm going to need to read. I'm doing it on the fly here. Um, if you could please write something down, that, that, if, if you could work on that, then I can be able to actually present it to people. Yeah. So, yes. I would like to say that I would not consider this from the amendment and would encourage Emily to present a separate motion. Okay. okay. So, um, we are now voting a, on a non binding resolution to see if the town will vote to instruct the select board to consider carbon free fueled vehicles in future highway equipment purchases. Is it all right? Does anybody have any other comments or questions, or does it look like we can? Yes, Lionel. I just want to make sure we want to hold this to, hello? I just want to make sure we're, we're, we, we intend to hold this only to highway vehicles. Uh, if the town has other vehicles, um, my assumption is that it would apply to any municipal vehicle, and I'm just wondering if that might be a friendly amendment. I'm looking at Alan. Uh, yes, if we have a, a decent wording, that's fine. So, um, is it right if I write on what you just gave to me? So, how would you think to instruct the select board to consider carbon free fueled vehicles in future? Well, it says highway. In future municipal purposes? Purchases. Okay, so um, we do we have a how, who gave us a second? And it's fine. Okay, so we, it, this is a friendly amendment to see if the town will vote to instruct the select board to consider carbon-free fuel vehicles in future municipal purchases. In future, even though it says vehicles, you're going to repeat vehicles twice. Is the English teacher okay with that, Nancy? <laughs> In future highway, I'm just, you, were gonna, you see where I'm running in a little bit of trouble here? I think, I think we get the sentiment. You get the sentiment. It is a non-binding resolution. Uh, oh. Okay. So, do you want me to read it, re repeat it one more time? To see if the town will vote to instruct the select board to consider carbon-free fueled vehicles in future municipal purchases. Okay, are we ready to vote on this? Oh yes, we have a question? Okay, are we, looks like we're ready to vote. All those in favor of this non-binding resolution, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, please indicate by saying nay. Nay. It appears that the ayes have it. The ayes have it, and this non-binding resolution passes. Is there any other legal business to come before? Uh, Jean Giddings. <coughs> Alan, I can give you that. 
I just want to point out, uh, I'm very pleased to see the, the listing of the services that our town provides, you know, animal licensing, hunting and fishing licensing, and I actually read them, and I got down to marriage licenses, and I think it's it's inaccurate, and I just wanted to mention it. It says that the town clerk's office on page eight, uh, that the town clerk's office can uh, issue a marriage license if one of the intendants lives in town. The state statute says yes, if you're a resident of Vermont, you're supposed to get your license where one of you lives. But people from out of state can get a license from any town clerk, including ours. And we sure want to encourage uh, our kids and grandkids that want to get married in our backyards to come back and reestablish our relationship with Vermont. So I want to just point that out. And, and you'd like to see something different perhaps in the next town report? If we're, if we're doing this again, which I hope we do, yeah. uh, unless there's been some change in a municipal ordinance where our town clerk is not allowed to issue the marriage licenses to people who don't live here, I think I'd like to make sure everybody knows that and that it says something different in the next town report. Thank you. That sounds great. Yes, we have a, a hand in the back. I'm Jonathan Johnson, the town clerk, and we will add that language next year, not a problem. Great, excellent. Uh, Eva and then Emily. Uh, we, the mic is for Eva in the back, and then we're going to, Emily may have some language for us. I'd like to request that the select board issue a certificate of congratulations to Yellow Barn for their 50 years of, I think, service really and uh, gifting to the funny community. I wonder if that could happen. What does the select board say? We'll take it under an advi under advisement. Yes, I think we could. If you want to stay in touch with Karen to have some wording behind that, et cetera, that would be great. Thanks, Eva. Okay, great. And now Emily. Okay, I want to uh, propose a couple of uh, last minute articles, and one I'm going to call the Mr. Miller, Miller article. Uh, because um, it's a non-binding resolution. A non-binding resolution, and this is the wording that I'm uh, putting it out, and people will understand why. Uh, to establish a committee to explore the potential of valuing work trade in lieu of U.S. dollars in payment property taxes, and to present a proposal for the 2020 town meeting and engage with and communicate with the select board about it. Historically, we used to do this. And, and is that the end of the resolution? Yes. That's okay, great. Can you give me the language, please? Thank you. There's the language I hope you can read it. Okay, so I'm going to read it in, and then we'll see if we, we can get a second, and then you could speak in favor of it. Uh, to, to establish a committee to explore the potential of valuing work trade in lieu of U.S. dollars in payment of property taxes and to present a proposal for 2020 town meeting and engage with and communicate with the select board. Is, do I have a second? A second with, from Janice Baldwin. So it has been moved and seconded. This is a non-binding resolution. Um, would it, does anybody have any questions or concerns? Which, Emily, would you like to speak on yeah. behalf of why you're bringing this? Yeah, I, I am particularly um, concerned that as Vermont, we are the highest taxed state in the nation and we do not have the highest income. Um, I am really concerned about people who have a hard time making their ends meet. I think Mr. Miller here uh, spoke to me privately that he's sweating bullets about his property tax. I open my house every year to people who are homeless over the winter. Um, there is a huge problem, uh, and I just think it's horrendously inhumane that people have to leave their homes uh, for lack of U.S. dollars, and there's a lot of other ways that they may be able to contribute. This was done historically. Historically, we used to grow hemp for taxes, and I think it's time to at least look at that possibility so that's why I'm proposing it. Is there anybody who wishes to speak against the non-binding resolution? It looks like then maybe we can move to a vote on this non-binding resolution to establish a committee to explore the potential of valuing work trade in lieu of U.S. dollars and payment of property taxes and to present a proposal for 2020 town meeting and engage with and communicate with the select board. All those in favor of this non-binding resolution, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, please indicate by saying nay. Nay. 
Uh, I think I'm going to need a hand count on this. So um, we're going to go to, if you, yes. So we're going to move to a hand count. All those in favor of this non-binding resolution, please indicate by raising your hands. I'm hoping somebody on the select board would count. Do you have a number? Okay. Uh, okay, so all those opposed, please indicate by saying nay or raising your hand, sorry. Okay. So do we, we have a vote? Can you tell yeah. us? Oh, did you get those two over here? Yeah, 13. So it appears that the resolution passes? The ayes have it. So the, it, it, the ayes have it, and this non-binding resolution does pass, yes? So can you please give us a total? 20 and 13. Did everybody hear that? 20 and 13. 20 for the ayes and 13 for the nays. Great. It looks like we're about ready to know. We've got one more. I do have one more, and uh, forgive me, but this has come into my world, and I need to share it. Um, this is a growing concern about the plans of the telecom industry to uh, launch satellites that will bathe the entire planet in high-frequency EMFs. And there have been numerous studies that have been, um, and I'm not, let me just put the wording out, but th that have been ignored in this. So what I want to do is put uh, a wording of an article, please. Uh, it would be a non-binding resolution. Thank you. Uh -huh. Okay, so it will be to establish a committee dedicated to the examine the real effects of 5G and uh, EMF uh, uh, radiation, and to consider providing EMF safe practices and to propose changes to our practices to protect children, plants, animals, and people, uh, and probably the same language at the end to communicate with our committee and bring a proposal for 2020. Um, can you stick all that language in there? Sorry, yeah. it's just, and do we have a second? Second. Second. Doug, second. Thank you. Okay, so we are now considering this non-binding resolution to establish a committee dedicated to examine the real effects of 5G and to consider providing EMF safe practices and to propose changes to our practices to protect children, plants, animals, and people to communicate with the select board. That's how I have it. Yes, Howard. It has been moved and seconded. Can I speak to it? Shall I speak to it? Uh, Howard, I didn't hear what your question was. Thank you. Um, many people have concerns about what, what she referred to is elect uh, the EMF stands for electro electromagnetic fields. Now. You're driving in your car, you can listen to the radio. That's because of electromagnetic fields. You can watch TV off the air. That is because of EMF. You can use your cell phone. That is because of EMF. And so we go. In other words, all modern communication that is not wired uses electromagnetic fields. And has this all began with the, with, with, with the advent of uh, of radio broadcasting, which was uh, in the uh, late uh, late 19 teens, early 1920s. In other words, the horse left the barn about 100 years ago. Uh, is there somebody else who wishes to speak to this non-binding resolution? Um, yeah, the horse left the barn, but uh, now the horse is a lot bigger, and the horse is going to keep getting bigger. And the question is. Is there a limit? Is it, do um, these uh, these frequencies? If you've ever driven to Keene um, and you've gone close to that big radio tower and you've been listening to the radio yourself, and all of a sudden the frequencies get all whacked out, and, and now you're listening to country music from somewhere else, 
Um, and then you, you notice that there are houses on both sides of you, um, and those people are experiencing that every day, 24 hours a day. Um, there, there has been some research that suggests that these frequencies uh, uh, can be linked to brain cancer and other issues. Um, it, it's, um, it's, it, we, simply because the horse left the barn, I don't think that's a reason not to take another look at the horse. Is there somebody who hasn't spoken who wishes to speak to this non-binding resolution? I'm, so we have two people who've already spoken. I'll go with Emily and then with Howard. Uh, I just want to uh, say that, yeah, in short, uh, Europe has banned, there are places, uh, many countries in Europe that have banned Wi-Fi in the classroom, and they have done it for a reason. And in the USA, uh, the FCC allows for electromagnetic radiation 100 times higher than Europe. There's so many details and there's so many concerns uh, that we will find out later. I can't speak to them all now. Uh, and I brought this article to bring it to you on your radar, to look up the dangers of 5G. And I'm uh, working with groups around the state um, and as we speak, Verizon has a $25 million uh, grant and AT&T has a $50 million grant and you will see more equipment going around on these, these telephone poles. Now, um, anybody who wants to be put on an email list to get a list of studies that have been done and all kinds of concerns, I'll be happy to have more company, we'll be, have more people to be aware of this. Thank you. Um, we have Howard in the back. Can we get the mic to Howard? And then we'll start to move to a vote on our non-binding resolution. The gentleman who spoke before uh, referred to uh, radio signals uh, breaking up in uh, car radios. The Federal Communications Commission licenses radio stations in the United States, and each is licensed to cover a certain area. Now. There are, there are stations on the same frequency all around the country. And if you happen to be at the edge between one station's an authorized antenna pattern and the next, and the, the, author, the authorized antenna pattern of the neighboring station on the same frequency, you will, at that boundary, receive both stations. This has absolutely nothing to do with danger. It has to do with radio frequency engineering. Are there any other comments? Then I am thinking we may be able to move to a vote on this non-binding resolution to establish a committee dedicated to examine the real effects of 5G and to consider providing EMF safe practices and to propose changes to our practices to protect children, plants, animals, and people to communicate with the select board. All those in favor of this non-binding resolution, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, please indicate by saying nay. Nay. Well, <laughs> I'm going to, I tend, well, can we do that one more time with voice? All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, please indicate by saying nay. Nay. It appears that the nays have it. The nays have it. This non-binding resolution does not pass. May I have a motion to adjourn? Doug. Oh. I'm new here. I don't know the total procedure. I have an announcement to make about the Energy Committee. Um, sure. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, if there's no objections, I think that's fine. If hearing no objections, let's hear that. So I've been involved since last year with the Energy Committee um, as a result of the, the town meeting resolution. Um, and as of a couple of meetings ago, I became the chairman. And we have three vacancies. I've talked to a few people tonight, but uh, we have some work to do before summertime regarding uh, Act 174, and that is to put together a town plan that I can't tell you all the details because I'm not an expert in that, but we have some work to do. So anybody that wants to join the Energy Committee next Tuesday, it's the second Tuesday of the month, 
Tuesday at 6.30 in Town Hall. Okay. Um, Thank you. Yes, and so I have in the back a hand. Ruby. Ruby McAdoo, I just wanted to thank you for providing childcare. This is the first year that I have um, noticed it was available and I took advantage of it. And my child was there all day, very happily. And um, I'm gonna let the world of parents know. So hopefully um, more people can utilize this service. So thank you to the school, to the town. I'm on the PTO who helped maybe encourage it, but whoever was responsible, thank you. And whatever I can do to move us to close, I would be happy to do so. <laughs> That's my ride home, I think, although I may have some other people. But um, unless there's any other announcements, I would look for a motion to, yes, and A motion to adjourn. Do we have a second? Sure. Second. That was Lionel. All those in favor of adjourning, please indicate, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, please indicate by saying nay. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much.